Uh, okay, start uh, today lecture. It will be the fifth and sixth of the series. And today we are going to talk about um, um, cosmic defects and also a nanograph uh, detect uh, uh, experiment for detecting uh, gravitational waves and some <clears throat> new physics models. Okay, uh, now, yeah, please start. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Hyun Min. Uh, thanks again for, for the introduction and welcome back everybody to the third and already final day of this short lecture series. Um, and yeah, as Hyun Min already said, today in the first part of the lecture, we'll talk about cosmic uh, defects. I will explain what that actually is to get us all on the same page. Uh, and in that first part of the lecture, I will then focus on a particular type of cosmic defects, namely cosmic strings. And in the second part of the lecture, uh, we'll then turn to some very recent developments, uh, new results by the nanograph pulsar timing array collaboration that have just been uh, released last year and that really triggered uh, a lot of activity uh, in the community and attracted a lot of, a lot of interest. So uh, we will see why uh, and what the discussion is about and what this could mean for uh, the future development in the field. But now let's first start with uh, cosmic defects. Yesterday, we already looked at uh, two other possible sources of primordial gravitational waves from the early universe, namely inflation um, uh, at well the very earliest stages of uh, inflationary cosmology after the Big Bang. Uh, and first order phase transitions. And in addition to these two sources, cosmic defects might also be a very interesting uh, and uh, well-motivated source of primordial gravitational waves. Okay, um, but before we talk about cosmic, or before we talk about uh, defects in the context of cosmology, let me take a step back and uh, talk about the equivalent of these objects in condensed metaphysics, because this might be a bit more familiar to some people in the audience. So we can, for, uh, con, we can, we can for instance, consider in condensed metaphysics uh, a ferromagnet and discuss the magnetization, the orientation of the magnetization vector inside the ferromagnet. Such a ferromagnetic material uh, can typically undergo a phase transition at some critical temperature, which is called the Curie temperature. And once the ferromagnetic material cools down uh, from temperatures above the Curie temperature to temp temperatures below, uh, it will turn from a paramagnet into a ferromagnet. And in that ferromagnet, now the magnetic dipoles, the atomic molecular dipoles inside the material, they align spontaneously due to some uh, exchange interaction among the individual elementary dipoles. Um, and in that new state, after the phase transition in the ferromagnetic phase, uh, we see that, uh, for instance, also uh, symmetries have become spontaneously broken that were still preserved in the uh, high temperature phase, in the paramagnetic phase. So now translation and rotation variants are spontaneously broken. You can see this here in this little cartoon. Uh, we have these individual domains uh, shown in white uh, and, and yellow. And in each of these domains, um, the magnetic dipoles point in the same direction, they are aligned, uh, which means that, uh, yeah, these regions are no longer uh, rotationally invariant. Uh, and if I move around in the ferromagnetic, in the ferromagnetic material, uh, then I will also experience, uh, I will also experience uh, jumps in the magnetization, uh, which means that uh, translation variance is no longer preserved. Okay, so I mentioned these magnetic domains already. These are regions of uniform magnetization and they're se separated by these black lines here in this little sketch. Uh, and this is what is called a domain wall uh, in the context uh, of uh, this, con in, in, in the context of this condensed matter system. Uh, these domain walls are stable unless some external force is applied. And in this case, this would be a magnetic field. You can also see this here in this little picture. I just took this from, uh, from Wikipedia. Um, so as soon as I apply a magnetic field, then these, uh, these uh, magnetic dipoles will align with the external magnetic field. And if the field strength is sufficiently strong, 
then all the magnetic dipoles will point into the same direction, which is what you see here on the right hand side uh, in the last picture. Um, and now the exciting prospect or conclusion from this discussion here is that a very similar phenomenology after phase transitions uh, might also occur in the early universe. Uh, and then we might as well uh, encounter domain walls in the early universe after a phase transition. And this is what uh, we want to talk about now. All right, so how about domain walls in cosmology? Here, we don't talk about the spontaneous breaking of translation invariance or rotational invariance, but we can consider a, a global symmetry in the context of the real scalar field theory. Okay, so I want to consider a real scalar field phi that lives in such a potential here as given in equation one. Uh, and as you can see from this potential, this scalar field respects a discrete Z2 symmetry. You can also see this here in the scalar potential on the left-hand side. So um, this potential is invariant under uh, basically, uh, well, exchanging phi by minus phi by flipping the sign of the field phi. This is this discrete Z2 symmetry. Now we can consider a phase transition in this theory, just like we talked about a phase transition, um, the ferromagnetic phase transition um, on the previous um, slide in the context of condensed metaphysics. And then after this phase transition, we will see that the scalar field settles down in one of the two uh, vacua, uh, global minima, which we see here, labeled by minus V, so some vacuum expectation uh, with a negative sign, minus V, or plus V, another uh, possible vacuum expectation of the scalar field. And then these expectation values, plus and minus V, they will be randomly distributed in the universe across position, spa across position space on length scales larger than the causal horizon. Um, and if that happens, and if we look at the universe at large and look at a large number of causally, con uh, causally connected patches at the same time, we'll see how the scalar field varies from one vacuum to the other, plus V, minus V, minus V, plus V, and so on. And these different domains will be separated again by domain walls, just like in the case of the ferromagnet. And at these domain walls, the field phi then transitions from one vacuum to the other. So depending on uh, in which way you traverse uh, position space, uh, you will see how the field changes from minus V to plus V or vice versa. And you can also see this here in my little cartoon. On the right-hand side, I plot a slice through position space. So x is on this axis, y is the other coordinate. And then if I move around in position space, I will first be in a region where the field phi is located in the negative vacuum, minus v. And then I cross the domain wall and reach the vacuum, reach a region in space where the field is located in the other vacuum, plus v. I can also look at the same situation here. Um, I can study the field value as a function of my spatial coordinate. Um, so if I move maybe along the x coordinate or some effective, yeah, some, some coordinate going from here to here, um, then I will see how the field value continuously changes from minus v to plus v. And the region in between where there's this steep gradient in the scalar field, that is the actual domain wall. All right, so we see again that after this phase transition in this uh, scalar field theory, the Z2 symmetry is uh, broken in these two vacua, but it remains unbroken at the center of the domain walls. So as we cross from one region, one domain to the other, uh, we have to make it across uh, over um, the barrier between the two vacua here in the scalar potential. So at the center of the domain wall, we, we will just be up here at the top of the scalar potential at the field value zero. So this would be here. Uh, just a field value of zero somewhere in position space. And then this is exactly where the Z2 symmetry uh, remains unbroken. So this is a characteristic feature of this domain wall that it preserves the underlying symmetry at its core. All right, um, and the domain wall itself carries energy. It carries energy uh, just from the gradient in the scalar field. So this would be energy contained in the kinetic term for the scalar field, uh, if you think about the Lagrangian for the scalar field phi. And it also carries potential energy just coming from this uh, V of phi here in equation one. Um, so, and you can calculate this energy here in the simple model 
and express this in terms of an energy per unit surface. And in this very simple model, it just depends on the two parameters, lambda, the self-coupling, and the expectation value, vacuum expectation value V here in the scalar potential. All right. So and in this very simple model of the Z2 symmetry is really uh, uh, an exact symmetry at the very beginning, um, or at least to extremely high precision, then these domain walls will be stable on cosmologically large timescales. Uh, if there's no significant bias among the two energies in the true vacua at minus V and plus V. All right, so uh, there you have it. This is the analog of domain walls uh, in comparison to condensed metaphysics in cosmology. And this now leads to an intriguing scenario. Uh, we can consider the production of gravitational waves that is emitted by such a network of cosmic defects after a cosmological phase transition. And here I just talked about the breaking of the Z2 symmetry, uh, but as we'll see in a second, this can be generalized to a much larger class of phase transitions in the early universe. All right, so let's do this. Uh, I started with domain walls, but the family of defects, cosmic defects in cosmology is in fact much, much richer. Uh, and to get a feeling for the type of objects that we might encounter in the early universe, I now want to discuss the generalization of the previous discussion to n scalar fields. So now I want to consider an n-dimensional scalar field space and uh, basically a very similar type of potential. So the potential is again of, of this type here. It's a Mexican head type scalar potential that I can use for breaking a symmetry. But now I suppose that the scalar field capital phi here is actually a vector in field space that has n components. So I break a much larger symmetry, some S-O-N symmetry. Um, this is how these scalar fields here transform. Uh, and then I can suppose that this S-O-N symmetry is either a global symmetry or even a local gauge symmetry. So I can, can, can consider both cases. Now, uh, let's have a look at different values of n. Uh, on the previous page, on the previous slide, we just discussed the case of a single scalar field. In that case, we broke that Z2 symmetry in the scalar potential, and we found domain walls. And then you can see, again, this little sketch up here. Uh, if we just talk about one scalar field, there will be a two-dimensional hypersurface, a two-dimensional plane on which the scalar field phi vanishes, where the underlying Z2 symmetry is still preserved and that defines the domain wall. Now we can look at two scalar fields uh, and the breaking of some SO2 symmetry, which is isomorphic to some U1 symmetry. So this could also, I mean, these two scalar fields could also, two real scalar fields could also just describe one complex scalar field. And in this case, I have to ask in which regions of space can I make sure that this underlying U1 symmetry is still unbroken and remains preserved after the phase transition. So I have to look at a position space and find the region where both the scalar field phi one vanishes. And this happens on, on this plane here. And I have to find the region where the second scalar field phi two vanishes as well. So that the underlying U1 symmetry is neither broken by phi one or by phi two. Phi two vanishes on this plane and then both fields just vanish on the intersection of these two planes, which is now a one-dimensional object. So along this one-dimensional object, and this is a cosmic string, the underlying U1 symmetry is still unbroken and preserved. So the conclusion is, after breaking a U1 symmetry in a cosmological phase transition, I can, um, I'm, I'm left with these cosmic defects in the form of cosmic strings. All right, so the last example I want to discuss is three scalar fields. And I just repeat the same story as before. Uh, we look at position space and have to ask ourselves, where do all the three scalar fields vanish at the same time? Phi one vanishes on this plane, phi two vanishes on this plane, phi three vanishes on this plane. The intersection is this uh, zero dimensional point uh, or region. Yeah, it's, it's a point. Uh, and then this is where the underlying SO, SO3 or SU2 symmetry remains unbroken after the phase transition. And this defines a new type of uh, cosmic defect, namely a monopole, a monopole of this SU2 symmetry. 
All right, so this is um, a first brief overview of different types of cosmic defects that we can produce in the early universe. Um, Hi, Kai, I, I yes. have a question. <laughs> please, please. Yeah. Is it necessary for a phase change to be first order to form such defects? No, <laughs> thank you very much oh. for this question. <laughs> I yeah. maybe should have said this somewhere here on the slide. This is a very important distinction, absolutely. Uh, because yesterday we talked about gravitational waves from a first order phase transition. Uh, and if it's second order, you don't have gravitational waves from such a phase transition. Um, but then if you think about cosmic defects, it's not, it's not necessary that the phase transition is of first order. So uh, whatever order the phase transition is, if it produces cosmic defects, there's still a chance that these cosmic defects can give you gravitational waves. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, all right, yeah, so. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Yeah, is there another question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember there's another special case of n equal to four. Uh-huh, yes, um, that's true. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, yeah, so if, if you take n to four, then you obtain a defect that's called a texture. Um, I don't know too much about textures, to be honest, uh, but I just know that they typically have not such an interesting uh, phenomenology. Yeah, so my, my, my naive understanding would be that a texture is something, um, well, a monopole is, is basically uh, point-like, but it can exist on a world line in space time, yeah, so it can exist forever if it's not unstable for some reason, or if it uh, doesn't annihilate with any other object. And I think a texture is something, it's also sort of a, I don't want to say anything wrong, yeah. So it's a, it's a special type of field configuration, but I think it's transient, so it appears and then disappears again, but please don't uh, quote me on this. Yeah, I mean, you can discuss what happens in the case n equals four. But um, the most interesting cases are really these three, domain walls, cosmic strings, and monopoles. I think this is all I can say about this. Uh, okay. I have one question, okay? Hi. Yes? Uh, did you have, do you have some comments on domain wall and the structure of bubble wall? Um, I'm not sure whether I really understood the question. Whether I have a comment on the structure of the bubble wall? Is that the question? Uh, uh, under the domain wall. It, 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 the difference between the two. Uh, the difference between a domain wall and a bubble wall? Uh, yeah, I mean a structure, yeah. Um, well, um, I mean, both are basically interpolations uh, between two vacuum and the scalar potential. Um, I mean, the bubble wall is, is constructed from the bound solution that we discussed yesterday. Um, and the domain wall, uh, I mean, is also a solution to the classical equations of motion. This is exactly what I wanted to say next here. So it's a solitonic solution of the classical equations of motion. I mean, the difference maybe is that uh, for the bubble wall during a phase transition, uh, you really have to do the calculation thermal field theory, all right? Uh, and yeah, then, yeah. then you look at the Euclidean action. The Euclidean action contains basically um, the negative of the effective scalar potential that you use in the um, Lorentzian action. Uh, and yeah, the domain wall, uh, sorry, the bubble wall, the bound solution is a solution to that equation of motion coming from that scalar potential. Uh, and then in here you yeah, also look at the equations of motion, uh, but, but the domain wall does not depend on it, uh, does not depend on any temperature effects in the scalar potential. So uh, if they're absolutely stable, then they are just solutions of the classical equations of motion and the tree level potential and they can exist down to very low temperatures, even temperatures, even t equals zero. If that happens, that leads to a cosmological problem because then at this point, the domain walls will dominate the energy budget of the universe. Um, in, fact, in fact, I want, I want uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking you may comment something on the domain decay or collapse of the more. This process, I mean, if, 
it, it should be different from the bubble collision, right? Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I, I fully understood. Yeah, so um, can, can you repeat maybe? Uh, the thermal decay or thermal collapse, this, this process, can you comment on that? Uh, the domain wall decay, yes. Uh, I mean, the domain wall decay, uh, that can also lead to uh, a signal in gravitational waves that has been studied by people in, in the literature. Uh, and well, I mean, it becomes a model dependent question at, at some point, uh, but you have to make sure, I mean, if you, don't, if, you want to, if you don't want to run into a cosmological problem uh, because domain walls would overclose the universe, then you have to make them unstable and they have to decay. So that's a potential source of gravitational waves. Yeah, I mean, this is being discussed in the literature. Um, but I mean, this, this would be, at the end, this would be independent of the dynamics of the phase transition. I mean, you have a phase transition breaking as a two symmetry. You produce these domain walls. They can potentially live for a very long time. Uh, and then, then they decay maybe because there is some bias term in the scalar potential, not, not, not because they immediately collide after the phase transition. So um, yeah, I think it's a similar process, but there, there are still some differences. Okay, I would say we can continue the discussion during the break uh, and then move on now. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I, I can also imagine that lots of questions will be answered by the things I want to mention on, on this slide in the next few slides. Okay. okay, okay. Uh, yeah, let's continue. So um, as I just said, and thank you very much for this question, as I just said, um, if you formally want to describe these objects, uh, then you have to solve the equations of motion of your underlying scalar field theory. And that gives you uh, the profile of, of these scalar fields. So in a sense, yes, it's similar to finding the profile of a vacuum bubble in the case of a first order phase transition. Um, and if you are breaking a local gauge symmetry, then you also have to solve the equation of motion uh, for the gauge fields. And that will give you the gauge configuration or the configuration of the gauge fields uh, on these uh, cosmic defects. All right. And I think this would also be a, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, uh, th this is qualitatively different to what you do for a, a bubble wall in the case of a first order phase transition. I mean, if I have a cosmic string, after the breaking of a local U1 symmetry, then this cosmic string will also have a profile of the gauge field uh, around it. Um, and then, yeah, so in, in the case of a bubble wall, in the case of a first order phase transition, uh, you really just talk about the gradients in the scalar field. Okay, um, I mean, here I just showed you this cartoon and then gave this um, basically heuristic uh, discussion in terms of this scalar um, potential and the scalar field transforming under SON. Uh, you can also take this to a more rigorous level. Um, so the general description of these topic, uh, top, sorry, the general description of these cosmic defects uh, is based on the theory of homotopy groups of the vacuum manifold M after symmetry breaking. So um, the homotopy group pi N of the vacuum manifold uh, counts the number of possible mappings from the n-dimensional sphere onto the vacuum manifold M. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so this is exactly what I wanted to say here. Counts the number of topologically inequivalent mids from the sphere to M. Uh, and then if one of these homotopy, homotopy groups is non-trivial, depending on the index N here, I know that the theory will exhibit topological defects after the phase transition, once I have reached the vacuum manifold M, okay? So if N is, is equal to zero, then I will form domain walls. If the first homotopy group, the fundamental group of my vacuum manifold is non-trivial, uh, I will form cosmic strings. And if pi two, the second homotopy group of the vacuum manifold is non-trivial, then I will find monopoles. So this is basically the mathematical language in which you can describe um, these topological defects. All right, uh, but again, this is just a flavor of, of what is possible in this entire field. In addition, there's an entire zoo of, for instance, composite uh, defects. People talk about dumbbells, yeah? um, things that consist of a string with monopoles and anti-monopoles on both ends. Um, this can also exist in certain uh, uh, field theories. 
and then there are also types of non-topological defects and so on and so forth. Um, but in the following, we'll just focus here on, on these most interesting and most prominent cases, namely domain walls, strings, and, and uh, domain walls, strings, and monopoles, and actually mostly on cosmic strings. Okay, so this was my brief introduction uh, to cosmic defects. And now let's turn to gravitational waves. We want to study how these objects can emit a background of gravitational waves. And in the next section, I want to focus on a general defect network. So this will be a discussion that applies to basically all kinds of cosmic defects. And then in the third part, I want to turn to cosmic strings in particular. All right. Um, so you can study the evolution of a cosmic defect network on the computer in large numerical lattice simulations. Uh, and it turns out that these networks approach a scaling regime, something that's called a scaling regime, sufficiently long after the time of their formation. This scaling regime, regime is a, an attractor solution of the dynamics. Um, and once the system is in that attractor solution or scaling regime, uh, its properties have more or less become independent of the initial conditions. Uh, in that scaling regime, the evolution is self-similar and all the crucial properties of the network um, remain constant despite the expansion. Uh, yes, and, and as I mentioned already, this is indicated by, uh, I mean, this is what you can see in numerical simulations, and this is also backed up by analytical arguments. So um, what's very interesting is that in this scaling regime, and this applies to yeah, domain walls and, and cosmic strings and, and all of that, is that, um, yeah, the crucial properties remain constant and are controlled by um, basically just a small number of parameters, typically just uh, one scale in the problem. Uh, and then in the context of cosmology, the only available scale is the Hubble rate or the Hubble scale. So during the scaling regime, you can express most quantities of your network just in terms of the expansion rate, just in terms of the Hubble parameter. So let's have a look at the number and energy densities of a few defect networks doing scaling. Um, as I said, the typical separation between the defects uh, grows like the Hubble radius. So this length scale L uh, in absence of any other scale is just, con uh, just controlled by the only available cosmological scale, which is the Hubble radius. Um, this is what you see in this scaling regime. And now we can look at the number density and energy density of a network of uh, domain walls. So I want to consider, you look at this little sketch down here, I want to consider a Hubble volume which is filled by these domain walls. And the typical distance, the typical separation between two domain walls is called L. So then if, if you uh, consider this geometry here, you can convince yourself that in this volume, the number of or the number density of domain walls is actually given by H squared over L. All right, so this is a rough estimate for the number of number density of domain walls in the scaling regime. Um, and now we saw that each domain wall has a surface tension, some energy per unit surface area. I want to call this sigma. I think I used the symbol sigma also before. Um, now in this Hubble volume, each domain wall has a carries an energy of sigma, the energy per unit surface, times a Hubble area. So sigma times h squared. If I multiply the number density by sigma times, sorry, sigma times a Hubble area, which would be sigma times h to the power minus two, okay? So two powers of the Hubble radius. If I multiply this number, the number, the number density of domain walls by uh, sigma and h to the power minus two, I obtain this estimate here. Sigma over L, which is uh, an estimate for the energy density of domain walls during the scaling regime. All right, um, so this is rho, little rho, and I can turn this into an energy density parameter uh, omega. So I divide by the critical or the total energy density, uh, which goes like H squared, the Hubble rate squared. So if I take this estimate here and divide by H squared, I find that omega goes like H to the power minus one. So for the domain wars during the scaling regime, the fractional energy or the relative energy in domain wars actually grows as a function of time. And this, as I mentioned already, can lead to a cosmological problem because um, uh, if these domain wars are around for a sufficiently long time, they can begin to dominate the energy of the universe 
uh, and then lead to drastic changes in the expansion history. So this is, this is basically a scenario that you want to avoid in a consistent cosmological model. We can also look at uh, the number and energy density of, of cosmic strings. So consider this geometry down here. Um, this is again a Hubble volume, or I mean in this sketch it's a slice through a Hubble volume. And I suppose that the cosmic strings are evenly spaced here, again with a typical separation of L. Then if you stare at this picture long enough, you can convince yourself that um, the number density of cosmic strings can be estimated like this. Hubble rate divided by L squared. So each of these cosmic strings also carries energy. They have a tension, which is energy per unit length. And I want to call this tension of my cosmic strings mu. So each cosmic string uh, has an energy of, in, inside the Hubble volume, uh, an energy of mu times a Hubble length. So I multiply my energy density, uh, sorry, my number density of cosmic strings here by mu times a Hubble radius. And I obtain this estimate for the energy density of cosmic strings. It goes like mu over L squared. Um, right, and uh, as I said, L scales like the Hubble radius. So the energy density in cosmic string goes like mu times H squared. So now I divide by the critical, en critical energy density, which goes like H squared. And I find that the omega parameter, omega strings is a constant. So this is a very interesting result for cosmic strings in the scaling regime. They just approach a configuration, a situation where the fraction energy density in cosmic strings re remains, con uh, remains the same with respect to the total energy density of the background. Uh, and then finally, I can consider monopoles. They just behave like uh, non-relativistic point particles. So the energy density in monopoles goes like the mass of the monopoles times the number density and the number density redshifts like the volume, like in the case of uh, ordinary matter, a pressureless dust. Okay, so uh, as I said already, this can lead to a couple of cosmological problems. The domain walls uh, and the monopoles, they can overclose the universe. So for instance, if I have a large abundance of monopoles around during radiation domination, the energy density in the monopoles will decay less fast than the energy density of radiation, so that at some point they begin to dominate the energy budget, and then this can lead to a cosmological problem. So to solve these problems, people typically employ the following solutions in the literature. I can, for instance, make the domain walls unstable, and we just talked about this a couple of minutes ago. Uh, this works if you introduce a bias between the two vacua in the scalar potential. So look at this Z2 symmetric scalar potential. If the one is slightly lower than the other one, then the domain walls are not exactly stable. And depending on the size of this bias term, uh, the domain walls, domain walls will have a lifetime and eventually the field will um, uh, tunnel from this vacuum to uh, the other one, which lies a bit uh, deeper, a bit lower, uh, and then these domain walls decay, all right? Uh, and then the classical solution to the monopole problem is just cosmic inflation. We talked about cosmic inflation yesterday already. Uh, I think I also briefly mentioned monopoles, but now I, I want to mention it again. Um, if monopoles have been produced in the very early universe and you want to avoid this monopole problem, um, then yes, inflation is, is a viable solution. Uh, if then at a point, I mean, if after the time of monopole, monopole production, you still have a stage of cosmic inflation, um, these monopoles can be diluted away uh, and no longer lead to any problems. All right. Um, so after this brief look at the scaling regime, I now want to discuss the properties of the gravitational wave spectrum that can be emitted by such a network. Uh, and for this, I want to look again at um, the omega parameter for gravitational waves at, I mean, today, and then related to the fractional energy density uh, at some temperature T at the time of uh, gravitational wave emission. Uh, we have seen this relation yesterday. So this is just based on the fact that the energy density in gravitational waves uh, redshifts like uh, one over the scale factor to the fourth power. So I can express this thing here as, as one over rho C, and then this ratio of scale factors to the fourth power uh, 
times the fractional energy density in gravitational waves at some earlier time. And then I divide by row total and I multiply by row total. Uh, and I argued already that uh, if this thing here in square brackets, if this is constant for some extended range of temperatures in the early universe, and if we are in radiation domination such that a to the fourth power times rho total at these early times is a constant as well. So if that is the case, then we'll find a flat gravitational wave spectrum. Uh, and yeah, if you want to look this up again, this is also something we discussed already in lecture 2a. All right, so, uh, and then now this network of cosmic defects is a perfect example for such a situation. Uh, as I just mentioned, the cosmic defects, they reach a scaling regime, which is a type of self-similar evolution. So in the case of a cosmic defect network, uh, we can really uh, anticipate that this object here in square brackets will be constant for an extended uh, range of temperatures. And then all the gravitational waves emitted by the cosmic defect network during radiation domination will give rise to a flat plateau in the gravitational wave spectrum. So we expect that the cosmic string net, uh, cosmic defect network will give us a flat gravitational wave spectrum across many frequencies, across a large range of frequencies. And I want to see this, I want to show this now a bit more explicitly based on a couple of the expressions that we introduced yesterday. So remember that we talked about the gravitational wave spectrum from a generic source. Uh, we did the calculation in radiation domination and I had one slide for the calculation in method domination. And I mentioned, I, I explained that the statistical properties of the source of gravitational waves is contained in the unequal time correlator, pi. So here uh, on the left-hand side in this equation, you see again the definition of this unequal time correlator. So remember, these are the Fourier modes of our anisotropic stress tensor. And if I take the expectation value of two Fourier modes at different times, eta and zeta, I obtain this unequal time power spectrum or this unequal time correlator here on the right-hand side. So this is still absolutely general. Uh, but now in the case of a cosmic defect network, uh, one can argue that pi should take this form here as shown on the right-hand side. Um, and well, I mean, I cannot derive this rigorously, uh, but there are a couple of arguments why it makes sense that pi should be of this form here. So first of all, you can convince yourself that pi has to have mass dimension five. Um, this is the case here. You have uh, v to the power uh, to the fourth power has mass dimension four, and then uh, we have uh, basically yeah uh, a square root of two times the conformal time down here gives us another mass dimension, so mass dimension five in total. Um, because this thing here is symmetric in these Fourier modes, you expect that this object here on the right hand side should also be a proportional to an even power of the underlying symmetry breaking scale. So we have uh, the symmetry breaking scale v of our phase transition that we're interested in. Uh, and it appears to some even power here, namely v to the fourth power. There's, uh, there's a question from Juan. Yes, there's a question. Please, please go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm late a bit. Uh, uh -huh. about, about the equation three, uh, yes. we usually expect uh, energy uh, uh, decreases as, as the universe in, uh, expands. Yes. But uh, what about this A force dependence? Uh huh. So uh, even if there is uh, this uh, A force increasing, uh, uh, there, is, uh, there is some, uh, the, the, the other terms kills this increasing uh, as the universe expands. Um, three, this A, uh, the, the dependence yes, on yes, the yes, A yes, force. Yes, oh. um, Okay, yeah, so, um, Maybe, maybe I should uh, go back and uh, explain again where this ratio of scalar factors comes from. I mean, mm. you can just forget about row total here and row total here, oh. it just cancels, yeah? So oh, I yeah. divide it by row total and I multiply by row oh, total. Oh, oh. One over row C uh, is automatically contained here, this omega parameter. Mm. And, and then basically, um, I mean, this spectrum at the present time is defined oh. as one over row C times this object yeah. today, okay? Yeah. But we know that this object here, Oh. Redshifts like uh, one over 
a to the fourth power. So I can relate the value today of this fractional energy density to the one at early times at high temperature by such a ratio of scale factors. Um, yeah, but that that uh, one over fours. And, yes. Uh, um, yes. Okay. I mean, uh, if I go back to earlier times, I mean, okay. I, I can I can say that I can set the present day value of a to just some okay. reference value, maybe one. Uh, 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 and in uh, the uh, past, a will be much much smaller. Yeah. yeah so yeah. at a redshift of of a, of a thousand, a will be roughly a thousand. Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> one over a thousand, so uh, ten to the minus uh, three. And then I go further back in time, and a becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, but at the same time, um, this thing here will also will also have been much larger in, in the past. All right. Okay. Uh, um, I think. I mean, yeah. If if you maybe sit down and uh, uh, maybe try to repeat the calculation I just mentioned, then then it would be very obvious. Um, I mean, it's really just the fact that uh, this thing here. I mean, initially. It has yes. I mean, you can also look at look at it the other way around. Uh, okay. At very early times, at very high temperatures, this is a very mm -hmm. large quantity. Mm -hmm. Okay, very high energy density in the early universe, uh, and then this is a very small factor. So some mm -hmm. small number up here, and then maybe one down here. So I take this very large number and, and multiply by this ratio of scale factors to the fourth power, mm -hmm. and then I find something much much smaller, which is the equivalent of this object here at later times today. All right. Okay. Uh -huh. So, and then, then I multiply by row total and I divide by row total. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if I go further back in time, this will always be constant uh, if, if I'm in radiation domination. So I go further back in time, A becomes smaller, 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 but mm -hmm. row radiation becomes larger, larger, larger. Mm -hmm. I mean, up to corrections in the relativistic degrees of freedom, up to changes in G star and G star S. But uh, yeah, up to these corrections, then this is a constant. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, all right. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about, I mean, okay, you can see it from this uh, simple argument here, um, but you can also see that the flat, that the spectrum becomes flat across many orders of magnitude and frequency range, uh, frequency space. Uh, if, if I do the formal calculation and just try to calculate the gravitational wave spectrum from these cosmic defects. So yeah, um, I, I wanted to motivate that this unequal time correlator has this form. Um, where, I mean, I just put a couple of factors. I mean, V to the fourth power appears here. Then it's symmetric in eta and, and zeta. Um, it has the correct redshifting behavior accounted for by these powers of the scale factor. But still, it's a very generic expression. I mean, I have this function U up here, uh, which really contains all the important information on, on the source. Um, so, I mean, it, it's not like that you can take this expression and already fully determine the gravitational wave spectrum. You still have to find uh, this function u, which contains all the nitty gritty details. And in the end, you really have to perform uh, lattice simulations to find uh, a good expression uh, for this function u up here. So, but I wanted to say, okay, there's no dependence on the absolute scale k. It's always just the scale k in relation to the horizon. So it's always this time of this product of wave number k times conformal time, which is given like this here during radiation domination. So um, the source is only interested in, about, in, about, is only interested in how different scales compare to the horizon during radiation domination. But during the scaling regime, during the self-similar evolution, the absolute value of the scale k does not really matter. OK, and I said the details uh, of the source properties are contained in this function u. Uh, which might be different for different types of defects, which are different for domain walls compared to cosmic strings and so on. So typically you want to determine this thing here on the lattice. Uh, but it turns out that in, um, in, in, in typical scenarios, uh, this thing decays like a power law uh, of these arguments here. So it's peaked when the arguments are similar to each other. Um, and then it decays like X to some power P, which is larger then, I mean, x to the power minus p, where p is larger than 2. OK, um, so this is all I wanted to say about this unequal time correlator. And now we can use our general solution for the gravitational wave spectrum that we derived yesterday. So I hope you remember this expression here. Yesterday, we convinced ourselves that the gravitational wave spectrum from a generic source is given as the double time integral over this object pi, the unequal time 
correlator. And that's also why we needed this thing that contains on two different time coordinates, because in this general expression here, we perform two time integrals over eta and zeta. Um, and now with this ansatz here for the unequal time correlator, we can try to evaluate um, this expression here in equation five. So first of all, uh, one needs to know the scale factor during radiation domination. Uh, I mean, the details are not important. Um, I mean, what I mentioned already yesterday is that during radiation domination, the scale factor is just linear in conformal time. If you solve the Friedman equation and then look at the full expression, the full result, this is what you get. So there's also the dependence on G star and G star S, but don't worry about this for now. I'm just telling you that uh, if you solve the Friedman equation during radiation domination, you can find this relation between the scale factor and in conformal time. Um, and now you can plug it in here. So A goes into this time integral and into this time integral. If we do this, then we find this expression here for the gravitational wave spectrum emitted during radiation domination. Um, so all these prefactors here, they are just a consequence of the scale factor. So basically just of the redshift behavior, the redshifting of, of gravitational waves uh, in, in, yeah, um, inside these integrals here. All right. Um, and then, then okay, everything- What is the V, sorry? What is the V? Yeah. V is the symmetry breaking scale. V is the symmetry breaking scale, absolutely. Yes, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's the, yes, I mean, as, as far as the properties of the source are concerned, uh, this is really the important mass scale. Um, I mean, yes, uh, I think maybe I should have said this earlier, but I wanted to say it here on this slide. The, the point is that these cosmic defects, they um, interact with each other uh, in a specific way. We'll talk about this and we will see this in the case of cosmic strings. So they can intersect and they can chop off elements and then they, they can collide um, and things like that. Um, and they can lose energy via the emission of gravitational waves, uh, for instance. So there are lots of processes going on in this network that leads to a situation where the network reaches this scaling regime. So in a sense, the network always constantly reorganizes itself also during the expansion, um, different modes will, different length scales will enter into the horizon. And then these, on, on these length scales, the network will reorganize itself to really reach this scaling regime. So there's a lot of things going on in the network. Uh, and then that really leads to some anisotropic stress. This sources, um, or this, this, I mean, this leads to an anisotropic stress in the energy momentum tensor of the cosmic defect network. Uh, and then eventually it leads to, yeah, I mean, this is the anisotropic stress uh, to this object pi here, uh, but pi is controlled by the properties of the network. And the only mass scale that can appear here also to get the mass dimension right is the symmetry breaking scale. Okay, so um, I wanted to say you get a couple of prefactors in the gravitational wave spectrum just from the scale factor. So this is trivial in a sense, it has nothing to do really with the, uh, properties of the network, you will always get the same prefactors here. All right. Uh, and then all the non-trivial physics remains in these, in this double time integral. So um, eta to the third power will remain here uh, and zeta to the third power will remain here. And then I have to plug in the unequal time uh, correlator. And all of this is what I want to call the function F. So everything that is non-trivial goes into this function F. And then here you see it. Um, can convince yourself that if I, well, take equation four and then six and plug this into equation five, then I can write the gravitational wave spectrum like this with a function f that you can see here in equation eight. All right. Um, and now what you find in typical cases for cosmic defect networks is that this object u, which really contains the details of the statistical properties uh, to get to case faster than one over x squared. This is what I said here. So uh, if I increase the value of the argument of this function, uh, this function u will become smaller and smaller and smaller, which means that um, defects on uh, scales deeper and deeper and deeper inside the horizon. So for larger k values, 
uh, they will contribute less and less to the gravitational wave spectrum or to the anisotropic stress here. Um, the most important contributions really come from the largest uh, K modes, which are those that are as large as the horizon. But anyway, the point is that this thing decays like, like a power law with a power law index of minus P, P larger than two. Um, and well, this only has to compete with this square root here. So in the end, the power law decay of this function U always wins uh, and the integrand decays sufficiently fast. Yeah? So it's a fast decaying integrand here in this double time integral so that um, the final result will become independent of, of the upper integration boundary. I mean, here I put some final values for the time. Maybe this is the time of meta radiation equality. Um, I can also just evaluate this function f at some intermediate time uh, before meta radiation equality or before these uh, final times here, eta final and zeta final. But the point is because the integrand is decaying sufficiently fast, um, the integral will not really depend on these upper integration boundaries. Uh, it will only depend on the initial integration boundaries, which are set by um, the onset of the scaling regime, for instance. Uh, but then there will be no non-trivial dependence anymore on uh, K. Uh, I will just evaluate this thing at, at some fixed initial time and the entire function F goes to a constant. Okay, um, I mean, maybe this is a bit, I'm, I'm not sure whether this is unsatisfactory or not. Uh, because I don't show any explicit expression here. Uh, but yeah, I, I can just tell you that this is what typically happens in many cases. Uh, so it's still not a rigorous proof, um, but typically if you want to convince yourself and see this explicitly, um, this is how you would do it if you knew the exact expression for this function u. Um, so the conclusion is the same again. Maybe it's a bit more convincing, maybe it's not, but uh, here in equation three, we saw already that we can find a flat gravitational wave spectrum during radiation domination. And now this is confirmed by this uh, more sophisticated or more complicated analysis if you really do the calculation and really calculate the gravitational wave spectrum because f, the function f goes to a constant, there will be again no frequency dependence or k dependence here in the gravitational wave spectrum. So we really find a flat plateau of gravitational waves during radiation domination. Uh, so yeah, this is what you can see here. I've taken this figure from this paper here. Uh, and well, they even perform some numerical lattice simulation to really calculate this object U here. Um, and then, okay, they factor out all the effects that are related to changes in the effective number of degrees of freedom. So here you don't see any effect of a changing G star or G star S. And then at high frequencies, uh, you really find a perfectly flat gravitational wave spectrum. Um, I mean, this entire discussion here was about radiation domination uh, because also up here we needed this behavior here during, uh, during meta domination. This is no longer true. During meta domination, I would have a power three up here. Um, so you can do a similar analysis to see what is the shape of the gravitational wave spectrum uh, during meta domination and then even uh, later during vacuum domination. And you find that in between um, F naught, which is a frequency controlled by the current value of the Hubble rate. So F naught basically is around 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the minus, yeah, I think around 10 to the minus 18 Hertz. Uh, and F equality, this is the frequency that corresponds to meta radiation equality. You have a decline of the gravitational wave spectrum uh, with a power law index of minus two, okay? Uh, so this is similar as in the case of primordial gravitational waves from inflation. I didn't really have much time uh, to talk about this yesterday, but if you think about the last slide I showed yesterday in my lecture on inflation where we had the transfer function and this imprint of all the different effects in the early universe on the gravitational wave spectrum from inflation, at the very lowest frequencies, you see a similar behavior as here. Okay, and then at the very lowest frequencies, I mean, this is here normalized to F equality, which is around, yeah, I don't want to say anything wrong, but I think uh, 10 to the minus 15 Hertz or something like this. Um, so these are really tiny, tiny, tiny frequencies. Um, uh, and then those correspond to gravitational waves that are larger than the current Hubble radius. Um, the spectrum decays like F to the third power. Uh, and then this is again, the power law behavior that you expect from causality. 
uh, we discussed this yesterday in the lecture on gravitational waves from phase transitions. If you look at gravitational waves emitted on scales larger than the Hubble radius or from patches, causally uh, or disconnected regions in space, then um, this unequal time correlator would just correspond to white noise. I uh, mentioned this yesterday as well. Uh, and then if you put white noise into um, expressions like this one here, then you find a decay like third power equal to lower frequencies. Okay, um, so this is a very general result. And this is how the irreducible stochastic gravitational wave background looks like uh, for any network of local, global, topological, or non-topological defects. Um, and this includes domain walls, cosmic strings, and monopoles. Uh, here, I'm just giving a couple of details on what they did in this paper here. They studied the breaking of some O4 symmetry, but um, yeah, that, that's maybe not as relevant. Okay, so I see I'm um, a bit behind time. Let's see how we uh, continue from here. Um, this is all I wanted to say about the general properties of gravitational waves from cosmic defects. And now I want to turn to uh, cosmic strings because I think that cosmic strings are particularly interesting. They don't lead to any overclosure problem. They can be produced in the early universe and then they can still exist up to today. Um, if this is what happens in your model, that would be perfectly fine. Uh, and I mentioned already that they have a constant energy fraction in the scaling regime. So this omega parameter for strings is constant during the scaling regime. Uh, so there's no, re there's no risk that this will increase over time and then at some point dominate the energy budget of the universe. Also, they're very well motivated in many BSM models. So we can talk about these explicit models later on if you like during the break. We can break symmetries like B minus L, a local B minus L symmetry and produce cosmic B minus L strings. I can also talk about axion strings if you break a pitchy quint symmetry and so on. Uh, and But what's really important from the perspective of gravitational waves is that they offer an extra mechanism of gravitational wave uh, emission. So in the previous section, we just talked about the entire network that reorganizes itself to maintain this scaling regime. And this reorganization of the defect network leads to some anisotropic stress. And then the network will emit gravitational waves particularly coming from um, the horizon size um, modes or objects in, inside the network. Uh, but in the case of cosmic strings, there's an additional mechanism to generate gravitational waves. As we will see in a cosmic string network, you can form loops. These loops oscillate and uh, can emit bursts of gravitational wave. Uh, bursts of gravitational waves are just um, emit gravitational waves at their oscillation frequency. Okay, um, gravitational waves are also very well motivated uh, from the perspective, yes, of, uh, of, of particle physics or underlying uh, field theory. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, I said this before, they can emerge from a phase transition when the fundamental group of the vacuum manifold M is non-trivial. So that means when the vacuum manifold is not simply connected. And then this happens, for instance, here, uh, if you break a U1 symmetry, in a Mexican head scalar potential. So this is my Mexican head. The U1 symmetry is broken down here at the bottom of the scalar potential. Uh, and this is my, my, my vacuum manifold M. This is not simply connected, uh, which means I uh, cannot contract this uh, path along the vacuum manifold uh, uh, in, into a single point down here. So if I walk around the vacuum manifold, this corresponds to such a path here in position space. And then I know that inside this path, uh, I will have a point up here in field space uh, at the top of the Mexican head potential where the underlying symmetry is still preserved. Uh, this is exactly this region here in position space, uh, this purple line. Uh, this is the one dimensional cosmic string where the U1 symmetry is not broken. Okay, uh, and if I embed this into a gauge symmetry, if the U1 symmetry is a local gauge symmetry, then these cosmic strings, they also carry magnetic flux with respect to this U1 symmetry, uh, which is quantized uh, in, in these flux units here, uh, where E is the U1 gauge coupling constant. So in a sense, these cosmic strings are the direct equivalent of uh, vortices in Ginzburg-Landau theory of superconductivity. So they have a very nice equivalent in condensed metaphysics. Um, and I should also say that the most important property of these cosmic strings is their tension, the amount of energy they carry per unit length. 
Uh, and this is controlled by symmetry breaking scale, um, the energy scale at which I break this U1 symmetry. Uh, so this gives me the tension, or equivalently, a G times mu, where G is just uh, Newton's constant. Uh, and then G times, mu, G times mu is a dimensionless number, a constant, um, which you see very often in these discussions on cosmic strings in the literature. All right, um, let's talk about a bit about the phenomenology of, of cosmic strings, uh, apart from gravitational waves. So it's interesting that strings uh, can source metric perturbations, scalar and intensive perturbations. And as such, they can have an effect on the temperature and isotropies uh, of the CMB. So you see this here on the left-hand side. Um, these are contributions to the temperature autocorrelation power spectrum uh, of the CMB uh, as a function of the multiple moment L. Uh, and then uh, the cosmic string contributions calculated for different cosmic string models, in the Nambu Goto, a billion Higgs. Uh, and we will talk about this also in a second about these different models. So for some time, it had been thought that the large scale structure in the universe might have actually been uh, induced by other defects such as cosmic strings. I think this was a popular um, hypothesis in the in the 80s, but then this didn't really live up to precise determinations of the CMB power spectra. Uh, and then nowadays, uh, the paradigm for the origin of these perturbations obviously is uh, inflation and cosmic strings as the origin of structure has fallen a bit out of favor. Um, so they cannot explain the origin of the large scale structure in the universe, but they're still very interesting because they can lead, for instance, to gravitational waves. All right, um, cosmic strings can also have another effect in the CMB. This is called the gott kaiser stebbins effect. And these would be these line-like discontinuities uh, in the CMB caused by a string uh, when it's in our line of sight. And we just look at uh, the CMB. So you can actually look for, uh, you can explicitly try to find cosmic strings in the CMB by detecting some statistical evidence for features like this here uh, in the CMB temperature map. Um, obviously, it has not yet been discovered. So there is no clear evidence for cosmic strings uh, in the CMB power spectra, and there's no evidence of such features here in the CMB. This allows one to put an upper bound on the cosmic string tension from CMB data. Uh, and then roughly uh, this bound at the moment is 10 to the minus 7 okay, on this quantity G times mu. Um, and because G times mu is controlled by the vacuum expectation value or the symmetry breaking scale V, uh, this directly translates into a bound on V. So this is around 10 to the 16. Okay, uh, and in addition to this, cosmic strings can lead to a couple of other interesting signatures. Uh, they can lead to lensing events, emission of cosmic rays, radio bursts, and of course, gravitational waves. And this is what I want to talk about now. Um, hello. 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 Yes. Can you explain more the right hand side plot? Why cosmic string cause some temperature difference? I, I don't know. Oh yes, yeah. I mean, this is this is a, a lensing effect, basically, right? Yeah. So the um, the cosmic string carries energy. It's this tension, uh, energy per unit length. Okay, uh, and that uh, curves space time uh, around uh, the, the cosmic string, uh, and then then the CMB photons uh, they are sort of deflected and then lensed uh, by the cosmic string if it is in our line of sight. So the where is the cosmic string? Are they in the middle? Uh, yes, like like here. Yeah, yeah. So along the diagonal, I, I would say yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. And it's it's really the flexion of the CMB photons. If the cosmic string is 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 uh, in front of the CMB, I mean, somewhere along the line of sight. Mm, thank you. It's a gravitational I mean, lensing effect because strings. the cosmic strings they're carry they're energy. Yeah. You mean the cosmic string the cosmic uh, cause the fixed uh, angle? The fixed angle. Yes. Um, that, uh, I'm, 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 so, not I'm not sure whether this is I'm not sure whether this is because of the, the deficit angle. I mean, the deficit angle typically is very small for, for these cosmic string uh, values of the cosmic string tension. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's the deficit angle. It might be. Okay, so uh, 
just gravitational energy. But I think, energy. I mean, just because you have this heavy object in front of the CMB, this massive object, this can lead to this gravitational lensing effect. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think we should move on because it's, uh, for me, it's five past nine already. Um, and I still wanted to mention a couple of things on, on cosmic strings. So I, I'm sorry. Um, I think I will have to go a bit over time again for, for this lecture. Um, I mean, we had a good discussion now already. Um, otherwise, we, I mean, we will have anyway a good discussion also during the break. But uh, I think I should spend maybe 10 more minutes or so to really mention a couple of the um, important things I want to say about cosmic strings here in this lecture. All right. Um, so yes, maybe in the interest of time, because we had many questions already, uh, I will just skip this slide here. So this is about the difference between uh, a billion Higgs strings and Nambogoto strings. Look at the details later if you like. The difference is that um, in the billion Higgs case, I remember that the cosmic strings are originate from a scalar field theory and I take into account all the particle degrees of freedom, um, the Higgs mode, the Higgs field and then the gauge field as well, like the physics model. Uh, and in the number go to case, I just describe cosmic strings as exactly one dimensional objects. All right. Um, but now we'll talk about yeah uh, inter uh, interactions inside the cosmic string network and in particular about these cosmic string loops. So you can see it here, cosmic strings, they can intersect, intercommute and chop off these loops. Uh, this can happen if, if two strings interact with each other, or this can also just happen if a string intersects with itself. Um, yes, I'm saying this here, loop production by a single string or pairs of string. And then these actions, well, the tangent vector along the string behaves discontinuously. Um, and these kinks on the cosmic string or on the cosmic string loop, um, they travel then in opposite directions at the speed of light. Um, and yes, so these cosmic string loops, they are chopped off from these long strings and they um, oscillate under their own tension and they emit gravitational waves. And we can estimate um, the strength of these gravitational waves just by using Einstein's quadrupole formula. Um, so this is an equation here derived by power emitted in gravitational waves, so energy uh, per time emitted in gravitational waves uh, by some time-dependent mass distribution. So I look at a mass distribution with a quadrupole moment Q. On the right-hand side, you just see the definition of the quadrupole. Uh, and then you have to look at the third time derivative um, and then look at this expectation value here. That gives you the power emitted in gravitational waves by this moving mass distribution. Uh, and we can try to use Einstein's quadrupole formula to just estimate the strength of gravitational waves emitted by a cosmic string loop. So let's say it has a length L and a mass M given in terms of the cosmic string tension. Then it has quadrupole moment Q, just mass times length, uh, length squared. Uh, and let's consider that it has an oscillation frequency omega, which is given, yeah, uh, roughly by uh, one over L, just by by its length. Okay, so if we use these very estimates for the quadruple moment and then the frequency or the characteristic time scale, then we can estimate the power emitted in gravitational waves. So we um, just use this oscillation frequency here as an estimate for the typical time scale when we estimate um, these time derivatives. And then we find the power is given uh, yeah, by this combination of factors. Uh, you can plug in all these estimates and then you find that uh, we expect the power to be proportional to G, Newton's constant, times mu squared. Uh, and in fact, this is the correct parameter dependence. So if you uh, study such cosmic string loops more carefully, uh, for instance, in numerical simulations, you find that the emit power emitted in gravitational waves by these loops really is given by G times mu squared, and uh, Newton's constant, cosmic string tension squared, um, times some proportionality constant gamma. So this is the only number we cannot determine from this back of the envelope estimate. And then you can do numerical solutions and determine the value of gamma. And it's found that it's sharply peaked around the value of 50. Um, 
But in principle, this already gives you the upshot of the entire story and see that the power emitted in gravitational waves is controlled by this combination of parameters. All right, um, so I mentioned kinks already. These are these things here, these kinks on the cosmic strings. Uh, but there are of features that propagate on the cosmic strings. These are called cusps. So kinks are discontin discontinuous jumps of the string tangent vector. Uh, the tangent vector just goes first in this direction and then at the kink, it suddenly changes its direction. Uh, and the cusp is a place on the string where it doubles back on itself. So the tangent vector goes into one direction, that's like a dead end, and it goes back from that point uh, and moves somewhere else in position space. Yeah? So one way and back again. This is, this is a cusp on the cosmic string. These uh, and cusps, kings, and king, king collisions can emit bursts of gravitational waves within a certain solid angle. Um, and this is indicated here in this little picture. So um, these features along the cosmic strings, they can beam gravitational waves um, in certain directions, depending on yeah, their geometry and direction of motion. Um, and then the superposition of all these individual gravitational wave bursts also contributes to the stochastic gravitational wave background. So one oscillations, uh, maybe at an oscillation frequency given by the length of the string, the fundamental oscillation, frequency or fu fundamental oscillation mode of the string that gives rise to gravitational waves, but then also these localized features, they also give rise to gravitational waves. Um, I should also briefly mention, maybe there are some experts in the audience. Uh, there's an ongoing debate in the literature. The question is, what is the dominant energy loss mechanism of cosmic strings? Um, and in the number go to picture, where strings are just purely one dimensional objects, you would say, the dominant energy loss mechanism is really gravitational waves from these loop oscillations and from bursts and kinks. This is the only option. However, in the Abelian Higgs picture, uh, you see in numerical simulations that cosmic strings also uh, radiate of particle emission, so massive Higgs bosons and massive gauge bosons. That particle radiation makes these loops very short lived, they decay within the Hubble time. So in this modeling approach, um, there's not enough time for the cosmic string loops to really emit a lot of gravitational waves. So the gravitational wave signal will be much weaker in the Abelian Higgs case compared to the number goto. Um, yes, that's why many studies actually focus on number goto strings because that just gives you a stronger signal. So this is the, this is the more optimistic scenario you can say. Um, but more work is certainly the remainder, remaining discrepancies. I mean, this debate has been ongoing for a long while. Uh, there are still lots of open questions uh, and more work is needed to settle this debate. Uh, and of course, like many other people, uh, we'll restrict ourselves to number goto strings in the following because they just give rise to a stronger gravitational wave signal. This is the more optimistic case. All right. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would say let, let, let's uh, spend a couple of more minutes on this. Um, I mean, I think this is really interesting and yeah, excuse me, I'm sorry for going over time again, but um, we already had a good discussion. So um, uh, I, I just want to, to wrap this up uh, and, and, and present this calculation of yeah, these, um, this analysis of gravitational waves from cosmic strings. So, uh, Let's consider the gravitational wave power by a group inside the network uh, with a length L. And let's consider the gravitational wave power per frequency bin uh, DF. Okay, so this object, the power in gravitational waves, uh, is, is now G times uh, mu squared. This is what we found from our uh, quadruple formula. Okay, so just based on our value of estimate. Uh, but now I want to be a bit more precise and really look at this object here precisely and study what is the gravitational wave emitted as a function of the length L and, and also um, yeah, per, per frequency bin. Uh, and then I want to put all the details here in, in this function uh, P of K, that's what this is. Okay, so each loop will oscillate at different harmonic excitations. Um, it can oscillate at its fundamental frequency by uh, two over its length, okay? So then two 
um, then there will be two oscillation maxima and two oscillation minima along the entire cosmic string. This is the this is the fundamental excitation of this cosmic string, just like in the case of a violin string, for instance. If you think about that, um, all right. Uh, but then there can also be higher excitations of this cosmic string loop, and I want to label these excitations, these higher highs of the cosmic string, by k, and k is just an integer. So one fundamental mode k equals two is the first uh, higher harmonic, and and so on. Right. Um, and then you see that I want to put the power from each individual harmonic excitation. Uh, P of K. This characterizes how much does each individual excitation contribute to the gravitational wave power. Okay, um, so these prefactors here already take care of um, the right mass dimensions. So P of K is mass is dimensionless. It's the dimensionless power spectrum describing the gravitational wave emission by the kth harmonic oscillation mode of a loop. Um, and well, in the literature has been worked out how this uh, P of K looks like for different sources of gravitational waves. So we can look at uh, uh, and they will have a power law dependence here with one over K to the power four thirds. And the kings also have a power law dependence with this power Q being of collisions, one finds a power law with one over K squared. Um, so the information, the important information about um, the K dependence is really this power law here and the prefactors, they just take care of the entire normalization. So if I take my P of K and sum over all the modes, I want to know what is the total power emitted in gravitational waves from all the harmonic excitations, I just sum over K from one to infinity. Uh, which means I sum over this one over k to the q factor, the Zeeman zeta function. Um, so that's why I have a Zeeman Ritter function down here. This cancels just after I take the sum. Uh, and then the sum is just given by gamma. I mean, um, gamma is just written here in front to really uh, determine the overall normalization. Uh, and this is something you have to match or fix by numerical simulations. And it's this number 50 that I mentioned here already do America simulation and look at the total power emitted in gravitational waves. All right. Um, and there we have it already, basically. So now we know um, the power emitted in gravitational waves, uh, not only the total power, total power would just be 50 times uh, this prefactor here, uh, but we've broken this down into the individual contributions from all the individual harmonic excitations. So now we just have to weight our power spectrum with a loop number density. We have to know how many loops are around at a certain length at a time. And then we have to integrate over loops of all length and we have to integrate over all emission times. Um, and this then leads to this expression here. So, I mean, don't worry about the details. Uh, you can try to derive this yourself if you like, but um, the philosophy behind this is really straightforward. Uh, we just take uh, the power emitted in gravitational waves from all the individual loops in their different uh, excitation, states of excitation. And then we integrate over all length scales L and we integrate over all emission times. And we, again, we have such a redshift factor here, which tells us how the gravitational wave energy is redshifted from some early time at the time of emission down to the present day um, when the scale factor is given by A naught. Uh, and N now is the loop number density. This tells us how many loops do we have per volume per infinitesimal length interval. All right, so we'll come to this in a second, the loop number density. And I should also say that now here, this is K prime related to F prime. I mean, here just introduced K and F, but K prime and F prime refer to the frequency at the time of emission. So there's an additional redshift factor in here if a cosmic string loop emits gravitational waves at some frequency f prime in the early universe, I still have to redshift this frequency uh, to its present day value to know at which frequency I will observe this gravitational wave today. Okay. Um, okay, so then in, in the last step, uh, I mean, what you see very often in the literature, I just want to mention this for completeness. Uh, this time integral here and in this redshift factor are written as um, a function of a redshift 
so well nothing exciting going on here this is just a, a change of variables so we write we rewrite our time integral as an integral of a redshift and we replace the integral over l by a discrete sum so uh, here i just treated as a continuous variable but um if we well consider the fact that a uh, cosmic string loop can only emit frequencies within a discrete spectrum corresponding to the discrete spectrum of harmonic excitations, it actually makes more sense to write a discrete sum here. So now we sum over K, where K appears here in this relation. Um, one over Z, uh, sorry, one plus Z is just the redshift that I introduced here. So here it's in terms of the scale factor. Here it's um, the redshift Z. Um, and now this sum over K, uh, well, plays an important role here and in this relation. If we're interested in a gravitational wave frequency today f, then we have to ask um, which cosmic string loops in the early universe had the right length l such that at that redshift z, uh, they produced that frequency f redshifted to or blue shifted to that early time uh, by means of its k harmonic ex excitation. So um, these parameters L, K, Z, and F always have to satisfy this relation to make sure that um, a cosmic string of the a cosmic string loop of, of the right length has emitted the right frequency at the right time by the correct harmonic excitation. Okay. Uh, and then finally, yes, I mean, everything else is just standard cosmology. We need, for instance, the standard time redshift relation in here. Uh, but yeah, this, this is independent of the cosmic strings. So the total signal now is the superposition of the gravitational wave emission from all the oscillation modes. Uh, this is accounted for by this sum over k here. Um, and in general, one needs to sum up to a large number of k values to get a real, uh, to get a reliable prediction. Um, yes, omega gravitational wave receives contributions from the kth modes of all loops of length l at time or redshift z. This is what I mentioned already. Um, and all the non-trivial physics is really contained in the loop number density here. So this is uh, where this is the hard part of the calculation. So if you really want to evaluate the gravitational wave spectrum, um, I mean, you can easily evaluate everything else. You can evaluate the Hubble parameter as a function of redshift and all of that. But the hard part is to come up with a good estimate or a good expression for the loop number density. And just for completeness, there's also an alternative approach to calculate the gravitational wave spectrum. Maybe this is again a comment for the experts. So instead of um, using this average power spectrum, I mean, this object here and this object here, which you match to numerical simulations, this is one approach. But alternatively, you can integrate from CUSP and KINGS, then use a different object here, R which is the burst rate per loop length and redshift bin. Um, I don't wanna say much more about this, but just for completeness, this is an additional or alternative approach, but typically those lead to a good agreement uh, if the parameters are properly matched. All right, um, let's see. Uh, so yeah, I still want to spend five minutes to wrap up this lecture and then we can, uh, then we can have a break. Let's see. Um, Yes, I don't want to say, don't want to say too many, I want to include too many details, but I, I just mentioned that the really interesting part here is the loop number density. How many loops do I have per volume and length interval? And yeah, let's skip these details, but I just want to say that there are different models for the loop number density in the literature. There's one analytical model. This is called the VOS model. This is the velocity dependent one scale model. This is fully analytically a type of simple differential equations. You can solve these differential equations and then maybe calibrate the model by comparing two simulations. There is a model by this group of authors. This is typically called the BOS model. They have performed large scale numerical simulations of the network. And then there's another group of authors, LRS, that have also performed numerical simulations, but they focus on the small scale structure of the network. The of these models for the loop number density 
uh, and the implications for the gravitational wave spectrum in a second. Okay, so what you find is that there's typically good agreement between this analytical model and the BOS model, uh, but then the predictions of the LRS model are different in some sense. I mean, it's similar in another sense, but there are some differences. So here you can finally see um, a gravitational wave spectrum from cosmic strings. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see something based on this BOS model. And on the right-hand side, this is from the LRS model. So in the B BOS case, on the left-hand side, we have different contributions to the gravitational wave spectrum, uh, loops that are produced during radiation domination and that decay during radiation domination. And then these loops basically contribute to the high frequency part of um, the gravitational wave spectrum. And this is also where we see this flat plateau. This is the flat dependence on the gravitational wave frequency that we talked about so much uh, earlier during this lecture. But then there are also contributions from cosmic string loops that are produced during radiation domination and that decay during method domination. And finally, cosmic string loops produced during, during method domination and that decay during method domination. On the right-hand side, we see the predictions from the S model. So it's a different loop number density. Uh, we have the same contributions, but two extra contributions. So small loops during radiation domination and small loops during method domination, and they really boost the gravitational wave spectrum. So if I use the same parameters, the same value of G times mu, say 10 to the minus 10, I get pretty different predictions, for instance, in the Lisa frequency band uh, for the two different models. So the rise here at low frequencies is f to the third to the power three halves. That is the same. Eventually, at very high temperatures, I uh, very high frequencies, I will find a frequency plateau. So you see it here and then up there. Um, also, the sensitivity of Lisa is remarkably the same. So Lisa can probe values of g times mu down to ten to the minus seven, and the same is true here for the LRS model. But then. Overall, the spectra still look pretty different, um, for instance, in the LISA frequency band. And LISA will be able to distinguish between the two models. So it will, uh, it might be able to spectrum or such a spectrum uh, and then distinguish between the models if there should be no further progress on the theoretical side uh, in the meantime. All right, um, now I think, yes, I want to uh, skip this slide. This is an additional parameter that is relevant for the gravitational wave spectrum from cosmic strings. This is the loop size alpha. Um, typically these loops are produced at a fixed size of the horizon at the time of production or a fixed size, fixed fraction of the typical length scale. So this is another free parameter alpha. You can determine this from the numerical simulations. There's some distribution here. As you make the cosmic string loops larger or smaller, uh, this will also affect the gravitational wave spectrum. Uh, that's all I wanted to say, and uh, we'll also come back to this in the next lecture. In the next lecture, so um, yeah, on the last slide, I just want to present very briefly a couple of present and future bounds on G times mu. So here on the left hand side, uh, no, I mentioned the CMB already. The CMB gives us an upper bound of ten to the minus seven. This is from the CMB power spectra, and then direct searches for cosmic strings in the CMB. Uh, Lisa will be able to give us a bound on G times mu around 10 to the minus 17. Um, you can see this here in this plot. So this is these are projected constraints on G mu and the loop size alpha by Lisa. And if we assume the VOS model for the loop number density and some typical value for the loop size around 0.1 here, Lisa will be able to go down to values as small as 10 to the minus 17. Um, and if I allow the loop size to vary, so if I just marginalize, if, if I put the most conservative constraint, if I don't put any, uh, if I don't fix alpha to a specific value, then Lisa will, in any case, be able to go down to um, values around 10 to the minus 11, around here. Okay, but these are projected future constraints. There are also existing constraints from ongoing experiments. So for instance, LIGO and Virgo, if you assume the BOS model for the loop number density, they constrain values of G times mu as small as 10 to the minus seven. So you see this here in the plot on the left-hand side. These are some gravitational wave spectra based on the BOS model. Um, and the current sensitivity allows us to rule out values as small as 10 to the minus seven. 
However, if LIGO and Virgo assume the LRS model for the loop number density, the spectrum will be boosted and much larger for the same values of G times mu. And so the current LIGO and Virgo data can exclude G times mu values as small as 10 to the minus 14 in the LRS case. Um, so in general, I would say that there's a huge discovery potential here with the existing and now, uh, just very briefly, I still want to mention constraints on G times mu from PTA experiments, from pulsar timing. They can also constrain uh, the string tension, the loop size parameter alpha, and another parameter, the intercommutation probability. So how likely it is that you chop off uh, a string segment or a string loop when two loops, or uh, sorry, when two strings uh, meet each other. Um, I mean, in the number go to case, this probability is just one, so that you will always chop off something from uh, your string. But it can be much, it can be smaller than one for cosmic superstrings in string theory. I didn't really have much time to talk about this, but these cosmic strings, they might also have an origin in string theory. Uh, and then this probability is smaller than one. Um, and this will also have an effect on the gravitational wave spectrum if you really talk about uh, cosmic superstrings. So here's a constraint. Here's some constraints. Um, on G times mu and alpha from EPTA, uh, the European Pulsar Timing Array collaboration. And if they use um, this model for the loop number density, they find a value of 10 to the minus 11, roughly. Um, then this has, the data has been reanalyzed in the context of the BOS model. So this is the one that agrees well with the analytical uh, estimates. You find, uh, again, something roughly of the order of 10 to the minus 11. Um, nanograph based on the data set, this is what you can see here, um, can constrain G times mu down to values of uh, yeah, 10 to the minus 10 based on the nine year data set. If I set this intercommutation probability to one up here, uh, a nanograph based on 11 years of data goes down to G times mu of uh, five times 10 to the minus 11. So this, this bound here. Um, so yeah, the conclusion is that PTAs yield the strongest constraints on the cosmic string parameter space. Uh, and in here, I'm just talking about PTA constraints up to the year 2018. Uh, and now the cliffhanger before the next lecture is that, um, well, this picture now needs to be updated because Nanograph has released some new data just last year. It's 12.5 years, a 12.5 year data set, which um, kind of, yeah, I mean, uh, promises to go beyond this picture and go beyond constraints. And maybe Nanograph has actually seen something and this is what we will discuss in the next lecture. But for now, let me uh, conclude here my take home messages. Uh, domain walls, strings and monopoles can form after phase transitions in the early universe. Uh, the network reaches a scaling regime, uh, a kind of attractor solution where the Hubble radius is the only relevant scale. Um, this network will produce an irreducible gravitational waves just because of um, the way in which the network reorganizes itself to maintain the scaling regime uh, with a characteristic shape that we briefly discussed. Um, cosmic strings are particularly well motivated um, and they emit, they have an extra source of gravitational waves from uh, cosmic string loops and they don't lead to any overclosure problem. Uh, there are two approaches to modeling uh, to modeling gravitation uh, to modeling cosmic strings, namely the Abelian Higgs and the number go to picture. And it's an open question how uh, what is yeah what is the relative importance of particle emission versus gravitational wave emission. Um, there are two different approaches to gravitational waves from cosmic strings. One is based on the average power spectrum. This is what we discussed in a bit more detail. The other one is based on the superposition of individual gravitational wave bursts. Um, there are different ways to analytically or numerically calculate the loop number density. So I mentioned the one scale velocity dependent one scale model VOS. And then these two models are based on numerical simulations by two, by two different groups. Um, and the relevant parameters of the cosmic string network are the cosmic string tension, the loop size parameter, and the intercommutation probability. And they can be constrained from CMB observations gravitational wave interferometers and PTA searches. So that's it for this lecture. Sorry about for going over time, um, but yeah, uh, I think this was, um, I mean, I, I wanted to mention a couple of these things and then this is also going to be relevant for the next lecture. Okay, so thank you very much.
Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank okay, you for your uh, nice lecture. Okay. Uh, so yes. Uh, we, we, break? The next action will be a bit shorter. Don't worry. I mean, yeah. Yes. Uh, if there, we can. If there are some questions, I can answer them now. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can have maybe a break of. What do you think? Um, yeah. We can. Shall we? Fifteen minutes, twenty minutes. What do you prefer? Yeah, we can. It's uh, it's up to you. Yeah, we can. Maybe twenty. It's, uh, it's up to you. Fifteen, yeah, fifteen minutes. Can. Yes. Okay. So then let's meet at uh, 55 or, or 50. Maybe. Yeah. Let's, let's meet at 50. For me, it would be 950. Okay. Okay. And for you, I guess, yeah. would be okay. uh, 450. 50. Okay. Uh, yes. But uh, I can still stay here for a couple mm -hmm. of minutes if there are some questions. Okay. So do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? Yeah, I, have, I have some questions. So, so in the cosmic string cases, uh, isn't there the so cosmic string cases? Uh, there is no there, more dilution from the inflation. Right? There is no more dilution from the inflation. Right? Dilution from inflation? Uh, typically not, but um, it's it's also a possibility. I mean, uh, there are papers. Uh, uh, a paper by Marek Levitsky come to my, comes to my mind right now. There are papers from the last couple of years where people study uh, basically the production of cosmic strings during inflation, maybe towards the end of inflation. So then these cosmic, this cosmic string network will experience some dilution, uh, but it will reorganize itself again in, in this scaling regime. Uh, and it will still be able to emit gravitational waves then at a later stage. Um, the signal will be suppressed compared to the case without any inflation, uh, but there's still prospects to actually see gravitational waves from such a diluted network of cosmic strings as well. So it's a possibility. One more thing is that if there is a cosmic string, so how can we still see the gravitational wave from the inflation? gravitational wave from the inflation? Oh yes, <laughs> this is this is a very good question. Um, maybe not. <laughs> no, I mean, um, yeah. it, it depends on the frequency yeah. that you're interested in, obviously, right? So let me go to a plot of the spectrum. Um, so I think, yeah, these are these are good spectra here. Um, I mean, at high frequencies, everything that you see here for SKA, Lisa, and ground based interferometers, mm -hmm. um, the cosmic string signal will be much stronger than the background signal from inflation. So I think in this case, it will not be possible to, bo to observe both, all right? Um, but then the cosmic string, the signal from cosmic strings uh, decays here um, if you go to lower frequencies. Um, and so, I mean, at frequencies, which you don't see here in the plot anymore, this will drop below the inflationary background. So for instance, in an, um, you can still hope to see gravitational waves, inflationary gravitational waves in the CMB, for instance. So you can hope, I mean, a, a nice scenario would be if you measure a tensor to scalar ratio in the CMB from inflationary gravitational waves. This is not spoiled by cosmic strings, but then at higher frequencies, you only see the gravitational wave signal from cosmic strings. But at CMB scales, cosmic strings, um, yeah, don't spoil the gravitational wave spectrum from inflation. Okay, so even if the cosmic string is generated before even if the inflation. cosmic string is generated before inflation. Mm -hmm. Oh, if it's generated before inflation, uh, then the network will just be strongly diluted. I think what I what I just mentioned about cosmic strings during inflation is that yeah, you produce them at some point during inflation. Um, I think if the network is diluted by 50 e folds, 60 e folds of inflation then I think there's no hope to see any gravitational wave spectrum from these cosmic strings. So, I mean, I, yeah, if you really want to see a strong signal from cosmic strings, the best you can hope for is that they are produced after inflation, maybe somewhere towards the end of inflation, but certainly not before inflation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, but... Um, okay, thank you. Yes. 
I mean, if you think about experiments like BBO, Big Bang Observer, they would be sensitive here around millihertz frequencies and would reach down to yeah, very small values of omega GW. Um, I mean, if there's a cosmic string signal here at these large values at these large amplitudes and an inflationary signal down here at 10 to the minus 16 or something like this, I think it would be, I mean, very challenging, if not impossible to separate these contributions and really see both gravitational waves from cosmic strings and inflation. So then, yeah, you would have to look at one type of gravitational wave spectrum at a time in the different frequency uh, regimes. Okay, there is there any more question? Okay, there is there any more question? Otherwise, uh, let's meet uh, like in 10 minutes. Uh, let's meet uh, like in 10 minutes. Yes, okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank See you, you in 10 minutes. Okay, see you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think you still need to start the recording. Ah, Sounds good. Okay. Yes. Recording in progress. Very good. <laughs> okay, so then let's start. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, and yeah, so uh, everybody who's still around, uh, congratulations, you've made it to the very last lecture in this lecture series. Um, and yeah, to finish this off, to conclude this lecture series, I now want to talk about some very current developments, nanograph, the signal that they've seen and its possible interpretations. Um, and yeah, in contrast to the previous five lectures, in this lecture, I will only show a very few a very small number of equations. So basically from now on, I will not present any explicit calculation anymore. And we'll mostly just look at uh, figures and colorful images. All right. And yeah, I try to wrap this up within maybe one hour and, and five minutes, or maybe even a bit less because I went over time already uh, a bit during the last lecture. Okay, so let's start with nanograph. I introduced nanograph already uh, on Wednesday. Um, Nanograv is a pulsar timing array collaboration that uses pulses in our local neighborhood in the Milky Way to look for low frequency, nanohertz frequency gravitational waves. Uh, and Nanograv has uh, announced a new observation last year in this preprint on the archive, which came out in September last year, where they um, say that they found strong evidence for a new stochastic common spectrum process at low frequencies in their pulsar data. And let's start with this figure here, which is uh, maybe the most important figure in this nanograph paper from last September. Uh, you can see the timing residual cross power spectrum for pulsars here on this axis as a function of frequency. So they take the timing residuals for all the individual pulsars they monitor during these observations and they look at the uh, cross power spectrum for different pulses here in the frequency domain. And this was based, or this is in the context of a search for an, NI, for, for an isotropic stochastic gravitational wave background based on the latest 12.5 year data set, which included 47 millisecond pulses. I think for this analysis, they used 45 millisecond pulses. And uh, what you can see here in this figure is um, basically a new signal that had not been discovered before in uh, previous PTA uh, analyses. So everything right here on the right-hand side of the spectrum at high frequencies is consistent with the noise expectation. So in these units that appear here on this axis, um, the noise would just manifest as um, a flat spectrum. But then you see a deviation from this noise spectrum in the lowest five frequency bins. Uh, it starts here maybe at uh, three nanohertz and then goes, uh, it's, it's visible in yeah, uh, the first few frequency bins. Uh, and nanograph, nanograph collaboration describes the properties of this excess here in this plot by means of a simple power law fit. So we can take um, this quantity here on the vertical axis and try to describe this in terms of a simple power law uh, that is described by some amplitude A and some spectral index gamma. And then nanograph um, 
basically fits this power law to the lowest five frequency bands and uh, determines the one and two sigma posterior constraints on the two parameters a and gamma. And this is what you can see here on the right hand side. So spectral index on this axis and amplitude uh, on this axis. For the simple power law fit, we have to look at um, these orange contours here. And it's important that this is a common spectrum process. And this is also what this CP stands for. So this is common spectrum process. Uh, that means you can use the same amplitude and the same spectral index to describe the properties or to describe the timing residuals of all the pulses, 45, 47, 45 pulses in the data set. Um, the alternative would be that you may see something in the data but that you have to describe it in terms of a different amplitude and a different spectral index for each of the individual pulses. But this is not the case. It's really a common spectrum process, which means one A and one gamma is enough. And this is maybe already a hint or some evidence that what you're seeing here is not related to the physics of the individual pulses, but it's really a common spectrum process, a common process that affects the timing residuals of all the pulses at the same time and in the same way. And obviously, um, this is a property or this is something that you would expect in the case of gravitational waves. So gravitational waves would be such a, a, a kind of a common spectrum process that affects the timing residuals of all the pulses in the same way. Now, um, these constraints here in an, uh, this parameter plane, they're consistent with the stagnation of upper bounds in recent years. Um, but in fact, some of the values you can see here in this plot, they are even larger than some of the upper bounds that have been published in the past in the PTA literature. Uh, and then I will talk about this in a second. Uh, first, I, I still want to mention two things. So Nanograph also performs a broken power law fit. This is this blue curve here. Um, and this is just to show that you can really describe the data in terms of two different contributions. You have one power law here at low frequencies that describes the single part of the spectrum and you have another power law uh, at high frequencies which describes the noise part of the spectrum. So then if you look at the amplitude and the index of this first power law here, the one and two sigma constraints, uh, posterior constraints are consistent. That just tells you that it's a reasonable assumption to break down the spectrum into two components. Then in addition, they perform a single power law fit just across the entire frequency range. Um, and that gives you these one and two sigma constraints here in the gamma versus A plane. Uh, and then you see this does a much worse job. And then the idea behind the single power law fit simply is to demonstrate that maybe it's not such a good idea to uh, assume uh, to just fit everything with the same spectrum. Uh, maybe the data is really telling us that there are two contributions, a signal at low frequencies and some noise at high frequencies. The second point I want to mention is that, of course, everything they're seeing here at low frequencies could still be due to some systematic effects. Um, and then Nanograph is aware of uh, different systematic effects that can have an impact on their data. For instance, pulsar spin noise or solar system effects. Um, we talked about the fact that in these pulsar timing measurements, you need to have a very precise definition of your coordinate system. You have to know the position of the solar system barycenter very precisely. And then for instance, if you don't know the exact position of Jupiter uh, to the required degree of, of precision, then there might be some systematic uncertainties in your coordinate system. And that could also, well, leave, leave, leave some, some imprint here in the data. But of course, yeah, Nanograph is very careful about these systematic effects. Uh, and it tries to mitigate them as much as possible. So for the rest of the talk, I want to assume that um, the signal is real, uh, that there really is something new in the data. Uh, it's not clear that it's gravitational waves, but in the first step, let's assume that the signal is indeed real. But of course, yeah, next question, is it gravitational waves? This is the all important question when you see something in the data. And for this, we have to look at the angular correlations described by the Hellings and Downs curve. We talked about this already uh, on Wednesday. And Hyun Min, you, you asked me about this, whether there are any constraints on the Hellings and Downs curve. And I only showed some, well, simulated data in comparison to the Hellings and Downs curve. But now for the first time we have uh, what, real data that uh, leads to an indication of a signal. And for the very first time, we can actually try to measure this angular correlation in the sky. So here we have the uh, correlation among the timing residuals of pairs of pulses as a function of the angle between them in the sky. 
um, and the blue curve is the Hellings Downs curve, and these gray violins are um, the reconstructed angular correlations from the nanograph data. So we see that there's no evidence for a monopole correlation. A monopole correlation would be just a straight line in this plot, like this orange dashed curve here. That would mean there's a correlation which just does not depend on the angle in the sky. Uh, but the data really does not prefer such a monopole correlation. This would originate, for instance, from some error in your reference clock, but uh, Nanograph can pretty firmly rule out that possibility. There's also no evidence for a dipole correlation. A dipole correlation would, be, would mean that I have some correlation that goes from a positive value to some negative value uh, across these uh, 180 degrees in the sky, but also the data leads, gives no evidence, provides no evidence for a dipole correlation. Something like this could, for instance, be um, induced by an error in the position of the solar system barycenter. So then the position uh, of the true solar system barycenter would move back and forth or compared to the position where you think uh, where it is or, or vice versa um, within a year as the, as the Earth goes around the sun. Um, but in the data, there's no evidence for such a dipole correlation. So how about the all important Hellings and Downs correlation? the quadrupole correlation shown by this blue curve here. Well, you can just look at the plot yourself. Um, there is no clear evidence yet uh, for such a correlation, but it's also not ruled out. So uh, one could imagine how in the future with more data, larger data sets, more pulses, these error bars will shrink. And then if we're lucky, and this is what everybody's hoping for, these error, bar, error bars shrink and converge onto the blue curve. This would really be solid evidence for um, the gravitational wave nature of this signal. All right, Nanograph also mm, considers the possibility of no correlations at all in the data, but that hypothesis is as well uh, rejected with a p-value of around 0.05. So, um, I mean, there seems to be some non-trivial correlation here, and then everybody hopes that this will converge or asymptote towards the Hellings and Downs quadrupole correlation with more data in the coming years. Um, so, I mean, you cannot claim yet that it's gravitational waves, but the situation looks actually, yeah, kind of promising, I would say. All right, uh, and here on this plot, I mentioned already on this slide, I mentioned that some of these very large values up here are in conflict with upper bounds on the amplitude that had been published in previous years. So let's discuss it. Let's discuss this in a bit more detail. Um, so nanograph, 12.5 years of data, give us a best fit value for the amplitude of 1.9 times 10 to the minus 15. Okay, so this is the best fit value, the median amplitude uh, based on nanograph at a reference frequency of one year, uh, reference frequency of one over one year. So um, yeah. Uh, for a specific value of the spectral index. This value of the spectral index, a 13 over three, is motivated by gravitational waves from supermassive black hole binaries. And I will talk about this um, in, in a few minutes, but this is a typical reference value for this spectral index. And there you can uh, yeah, uh, determine your upper bound on the amplitude and then compare this to other experiments. All right, so here are the upper bounds by the previous experiments at 95% confidence level. Um, EPTA had a bound of three times 10 to the minus 15. So this is uh, still above this number and there's no conflict. But nanograph itself had um, a bound of 1.45 times 10 to the minus 15 based on its 11 year data set. So this is already smaller than this best fit amplitude here. And then PPTA, had an even stronger bound of one times 10 to the minus 15 um, based on its latest data set, which is yeah uh, smaller than this number here by a factor of two almost. So how is this possible? How is this possible that Nanograph now sees a signal that is stronger than upper bounds that had been published before? So the explanation is that um, now people think that there's nothing wrong with these bounds and in this nanograph detection, but it just depends on some details of the Bayesian statistical analysis. So some details really do matter uh, at this stage where the signal is still hard to distinguish from the background. Um, so mm, 
as yeah, a first comment to understand what's going on here, let me say that the data analysis typically includes a red noise model for each pulsar. So for each pulsar, you have to characterize <coughs> the noise at low frequencies. And you do this in terms of some noise amplitude, A for red noise, and some Paolo index gamma red noise for, for each pulsar. Uh, and then you perform this Bayesian analysis uh, and have to uh, define the prior assumptions on these two parameters. Okay. Uh, it turns out that if you do the, the Bayesian analysis and you use a uniform prior on this red noise amplitude here, that this can actually lead to upper bounds that are too strong in more than 50% of the cases. So upper bounds below the actual induced signal in more than 50% of the cases. This has been shown in this paper here that came out just a few days after the first nanograph paper. These people are affiliated with or are members of the nanograph collaboration. The first nanograph paper came out on a Friday and this paper just came out after the weekend on Monday. So even before the first theory explanations. Uh, and then you see some theoretical expectation how upper bounds on your gravitational wave amplitude are supposed to um, evolve over time as you take, if, as you accumulate more and more PTA uh, data. Uh, and then they show different bounds depending on the different prior assumptions in your Bayesian uh, analysis. So here in this paper, they have some, they perform some, um, um, they, they generate some mock data, some mock PTA data for um, all these yeah, uh, observation uh, durations here. And they induce an artificial gravitational wave signal down here. So at this gray dashed line, this is the induced gravitational wave signal. And then they see uh, to what extent mm, the PTA analysis is, is uh, more sensitive to the signal, to what extent uh, is one able to put upper bounds on the amplitude and at which point does one become sensitive to the actual signal. And we can look at um, these blue violins here where you impose a uniform Bayesian prior on the red noise amplitude uh, in, in your noise model, okay? Uh, and then you see that here after uh, almost seven years of data taking and a bit more of 11 years of data taking, uh, these upper bounds are sometimes uh, too strong. They, they give upper bounds which are actually below the induced signal in more than 50% of the cases. And you can mitigate this. Um, oh, I mean, I should say, yeah, this is most likely what happened uh, this is this is uh, now the idea. The claim is that this is what happened here in these analyses. That uh, these analyses really imposed uh, a uniform prior um, on the red noise amplitude, and thus just obtained bounds that were too strong compared to the size of the actual signal. So there are different ways to mitigate um, this problem here in the spatial analysis. You can just use a log uniform prior on the amplitude. These would be these purple violins here they do a much better job. So if you just use a different prior assumption uh, on your red noise model, um, then you don't run into such conflicts. Uh, and then also yeah, some more sophisticated statistical analyses. Uh, Nanograph has developed a dropout method where they can um, have extra parameters in the Monte Carlo Markov chain and that can switch on and off the red noise for individual passes. So if you do this, you only include uh, a red noise for a pulsar if it has any effect on uh, the final outcome. If it's insignificant, then you just don't care about it and you switch off that noise contribution. Um, and then this is shown here based uh, in, in this color. So if you use a uh, drop out method, then you also don't find bounds that are actually too strong. Okay, so the lesson from this exercise here is that the correct treatment of pulsar noise is a double edged sword. It's a really tricky business. Um, gravitational wave searches may result in a false positive if the pulsar noise is not properly modeled. So it's really important to get this right. If you're not careful enough about um, the noise model, then uh, you may see a gravitational wave signal in cases where it's not even there. But then if you're too careful about it, you can also run and you can also have a false negative uh, if the noise model misinter misinterprets the single power uh, and uh, signal power is absorbed in noise power. This is also something you want to avoid because then your noise model is too powerful uh, and then basically hides the signal, which actually is there in the data. What so the only solution white, to this is uh, that- the um, line? Yes. So what is the test line. line? The white line. Oh, this is a very good question. So what is the test? Yes, yes. So uh, the violence here 
Um, these are the outcome of a Bayesian statistical analysis. Uh, and with the same data set, you can also uh, try to do the same based on a frequentist statistical analysis. Um, and this is this white dashed line here. So the white dashed line is the theoretical optimal statistic upper limit based on some frequentist analysis. So colorful violence, Bayesian analysis, white dashed line, frequentist analysis. This gives you some expectation for how um, these upper limits should evolve from a frequentist perspective. Yeah, thank you for this question. I should have mentioned this. Now that's, that's important detail in this plot. Um, okay, so I mean, nothing was wrong about uh, these measurements here. They did everything correctly. I mean, if you specify what you do in the analysis and then you don't make any mistake in the analysis, um, then the result is what it is and um, stands for itself. So there was nothing wrong, but um, um, these Bayesian analysis and the prior assumptions are tricky. And this can only be resolved eventually if we have more data. And then as soon as the signal sticks out from the background at a larger signal to noise ratio, then these details will no longer be as important. So if we have a really strong signal with a very large signal to noise ratio, then um, you can basically use whichever prior you want for a strong signal, you will always recover it in the data. But yeah, so again, let's assume that the nanograph signal is real, that there's no real conflict uh, with these bounds here from PPTA and the other experiments. Um, so let's assume that this is the explanation of what's going on. Uh, and let's assume that nanograph really has seen um, a true signal in the data. So this was my introduction to the nanograph signal. And now I want to turn to gravitational waves again and the possible interpretations of the, of the nanograph signal. And first I will introduce, um, I will discuss a couple of, um, uh, a range of possibilities that have been put forward in the literature. Uh, and then I'll focus a bit more on cosmic strings. All right. Um, so maybe the most down to earth explanation of the nanograph signal. Uh, and this is maybe also what most people in the field expect would be in an interpretation in terms of astrophysics, namely supermassive black hole binaries. Uh, here you can see a chart of the gravitational wave landscape uh, and the kind of uh, compact binary mergers that different experiments are sensitive to. So at high frequencies, LIGO, Virgo, and other ground-based interferometers are sensitive to um, the mergers of stellar black holes uh, with masses of uh, a couple of dozens of solar masses. Then space-based interfer space interferometers such as LISA, um, they will be sensitive to mergers from heavier intermediate mass black holes um, with masses of 10 to the four, five, six solar masses. But then here in the PTA range at nanohertz frequencies, uh, the PTAs, they are sensitive to gravitational waves from the mergers of supermassive black holes. So these are really uh, masses of uh, billions of solar masses uh, and in binary systems that form when entire galaxies merge. So you have to think about a galaxy merger uh, each of the two galaxies has a supermassive black hole at its center. Then the two galaxies merge uh, and the two supermassive black holes, they find each other um, and enter some uh, in spiraling orbit and form a binary system such that they eventually merge after billions of years. So this would be the origin of these objects that can give rise to gravitational waves in the nanohertz frequency range. Um, right. And the characteristic gravitational wave spectrum that you expect from these systems would be um, would have a power law here with respect to characteristic strain HC. We introduced this in the first lecture, uh, and the power law index would be minus two thirds. If I express this in terms of this timing residual cross power spectrum S that we have, uh, for instance, whoop, uh, seen here then um, a power law index of minus two thirds in the other plot translates into gamma of 13 over three here. So this black line, black dashed line at 13 over three uh, is just the prediction from supermassive black hole binaries. And it's perfectly consistent with the data. Uh, it, it doesn't really reach into the one sigma contour, but it certainly touches, I mean, it's around here, um, certainly inside the two sigma contour. Um, and, and yeah, so absolutely consistent with the data. Let's go back. All right. 
Um, so the overall expectation from these systems would be to have some stochastic background and then some popcorn noise from resolved binaries. If there are two supermassive black, hole, black holes in a binary system that emit a very strong gravitational wave signal, uh, you hope to be able to resolve them individually. And these are these blue triangles here up in this plot. Okay, so this is a viable explanation of the nanograph signal, but it comes with a couple of open questions and unknowns. So an open question is what are actually the seeds of these supermassive black holes um, in the history of the universe? Uh, how do they actually become so massive? What is their growth history? Uh, how often do they form? Uh, uh, what is the abundance of these binary systems? Uh, at which rate do they merge? Is this merger rate um, comparable to the age of the universe? Maybe uh, it's much larger than the age of the universe, and then this merger rate would be insufficient. There's also the um, final parsec problem. So um, we know galaxies with two supermassive black holes in them that are still separated by large distances of the order of um, uh, kiloparsec. But to really enter this final stage of inspiraling and merger, you have to get these two um, supermassive black holes close enough within a parsec. And then that's very hard to achieve because they have to get rid of the angular momentum. And um, uh, yeah, they have to get rid of the angular momentum. So you have to achieve somehow dynamical friction so that the, such the close binary forms within the age of the universe. Um, and obviously there are lots of ideas in the literature how this can happen. Um, but none of this has been really confirmed yet. So in the end, we just need more data. It might be that the solution here really works out and we can have a sufficiently strong gravitational wave signal from supermassive black hole binaries to explain the nanograph signal. But it might also be that one of these questions here has some sort of a negative answer so that there is no satisfactory solution to the final parsec problem. And in this case, gravitational waves from supermassive black hole binaries uh, might still be there, but they might be too weak to really explain nanograph. And then we have to resort to alternative explanations. Okay, um, here in this slide, I just wanted to motivate why we have uh, this power law dependence for supermassive black hole binaries, but um, this is a technical detail. You can look at this later if you like. Um, and now let's turn to BSM interpretations of the nanograph signal. So now let's assume that uh, supermassive black holes, uh, supermassive black hole binaries, alone are not enough to explain the nanograph signal. Uh, and motivated by this prospect, uh, prospect, lots and lots of authors have proposed alternative explanations of the nanograph signal, um, starting with cosmic strings. Um, this is also where uh, my collaborators and I contributed ourselves. Uh, but then also explanations tied to the production of primordial black holes in the early universe. Cosmological phase transitions, we talked about this yesterday. Then um, an axion model called audible axions, I will mention this in a few minutes, um, that can also lead to gravitational waves. Axion strings, uh, we just talked about cosmic strings in the previous lecture. Cosmic inflation, we talked about cosmic inflation yesterday during the first lecture. Domain walls, which we mentioned uh, during the first lecture today. Um, and then also things like violation of the null energy condition. I'm not an expert on this, so I don't really know how this leads to gravitational waves. But if you're interested in that, you can have a look at these papers here. All right, so yeah, now I want to spend a few minutes to go through these individual uh, interpretations one by one. So cosmic inflation can actually explain uh, the nanograph signal in a certain parts of parameter space. The mechanism is the one that we discussed yesterday. So during cosmic inflation, uh, vacuum fluctuations of the space-time metric are stretched to super horizon size. These quantum fluctuations, they leave the Hubble horizon, they freeze out outside the Hubble horizon, and then during the later stages of the evolution, they re-enter into the Hubble horizon in the form of classical gravitational waves, uh, and then they propagate through the universe and then re um, produce a, uh, a background, a stochastic background of gravitational waves. All right. Um, and then here you can see a plot of some of the inflationary parameters, the tensor to scalar ratio on this axis and the tensor index or tensor tilt on the other axis. Um, these are the parameters that enter into the primordial tensor power spectrum. R is here in front and the tensor index is up here. And we actually calculated PH uh, yesterday. 
Um, however, to really um, fit the nanograph signal here in this blue region, you have to have a very large value of this tensor index. That just means that the amplitude of this tensor power spectrum is constrained to be small at CMB scales. Uh, and then in between the CMB scales and nanograph scales, uh, you really have to run up in amplitude by a lot uh, to reach um, the part of the spectrum where nanograph now uh, claims to have detected a signal. And for this, you need a large index, a large blue index to really go from the low values at the CMB scale up all the way up to the comparatively larger values at um, the PTA scales. All right. Um, and obviously, if you have such a large spectral index, this is in conflict, for instance, with dire constraints from LIGO and Virgo, because uh, then you say, okay, if I extrapolate this even further up to higher frequencies, then uh, LIGO and Virgo should have seen the same signal as well, but they haven't. So uh, there's a problem there. Uh, and also, if you have a such, such a steep, steeply rising gravitational wave spectrum, uh, you integrate over the entire spectrum to find the amount of gravitational wave dark radiation. We talked about this yesterday, and then you will violate the bounds on and effective. There's one way to avoid these problems, namely if you just impose a tight bound on um, the reading temperature. If you just if you say that the universe only reheated up to ten temperatures around uh, 100 GeV, then the gravitational wave spectrum from inflation will just shut off at some frequency, um, at some low frequency, before you actually reach the LIGO and Virgo band. And if you um, shut off the gravitational wave spectrum from inflation at that point, then you can also avoid this bound from uh, N effective. So it requires some model building and some extra assumptions. But if you're willing to make these assumptions, then uh, inflation in principle could be a viable explanation. But then in addition, you also have to come up with a particle physics model or some microscopic model of inflation that actually tells you why the tensor index is so large. Uh, remember in standard single field slow roll inflation, NT is typically, I mean, it's, it's bound to be negative. Uh, so actually you would have a red tilt in the spectrum. Um, but yeah, in more exotic models or uh, models with more degrees of freedom, for instance, if you include gauge fields, then this can become positive. So this requires some extra model building to actually uh, reach this part here of the inflationary parameter space. All right, so this is everything I wanted to say about um, inflation as a possible interpretation. Um, so then there's the possibility to use axions to explain nanograph. The idea is to use some axion-like particle and couple this to this topological term for the gauge fields of some dark U1 symmetry. The axion field lives in such an axion potential, typical axion potential, um, and then it is fixed at some initial large field value during radiation domination. But when the Hubble rate becomes as small as the mass of the axion here in the scalar potential, the axion will begin to roll. It will roll in this uh, cosine potential down to um, a local minimum. And as the axon field is rolling, it will trigger some exponential particle production of dark U1 gauge bosons. And these dark photons, um, they contribute to the energy momentum tensor uh, on the right-hand side of the equation of motion for the tensor perturbations, and that sources gravitational waves. So this has been studied by these authors here, Wolfram Ratzinger and Pietro Schwaller uh, in Mainz, and they calculate the gravitational wave spectrum, which fits well the nanograph data, and they can use this to constrain the parameters of the model. They constrain the uh, axion decay constant, um, right, uh, and, and the axion mass. Everything up here is excluded by N effective because you just produce too much dark radiation. Um, but you can see that the nanograph bound is now comparable to these other cosmological probes. And there's this remaining region here in parameter space that actually allows to explain the nanograph signal. In the meantime, there have also been um, other analysis uh, revising uh, this explanation here or uh, performing a more sophisticated analysis. Uh, but in principle, uh, it, it remains true that these uh, axions coupling to gauge fields in the early universe are a very interesting source of gravitational waves. All right. Um, and this can be then probed uh, in the future in, in axion experiments, and maybe also via the phenomenon of black hole super radiance. All right. Um, maybe I will just skip this one here. 
Um, you can have a look at this later if you like. Axions can also form uh, global strings with respect to the U1 Petri Quinn symmetry. Um, and then these global axion strings can also emit gravitational waves, but because we're talking about global strings, um, these can also emit uh, axions themselves uh, and then lead to problems with delta N effective. So that's another possibility, but you yeah, somehow have to work a bit to satisfy the constraints on delta on N effective. I, I want to move on to um, another explanation, namely one that is related to the production of primordial black holes. So uh, we mentioned this at some point already during um, the discussion. Um, there's this intriguing possibility that inflation leads to enhanced curvature and density perturbations at small scales. So scales much smaller than the CMB scale. Uh, and if that happens, then these strongly enhanced curvature perturbations, they can actually lead to the production of uh, primordial black holes when they re-enter into the Hubble horizon after inflation. So then these very large curvature, but curvature perturbations just uh, re-enter into the horizon and collapse into primordial black holes. And at the same time, if I have such strong curvature perturbations, um, they couple to tensor perturbations at the second order in perturbation theory. So um, strong curvature perturbations from inflation can actually induce um, gravitational waves at the second order in perturbation theory. Uh, and now this has been put forward as well as an, as an interpretation of nanograph. And then there's some correlation uh, among your predictions for gravitational waves and your predictions about primordial black holes. So I want to mention this paper here by, by these authors. Um, they study exactly such a scenario um, and they find that the primordial black holes produced uh, in during inflation or after inflation have masses of roughly 10 to the three solar masses. Um, so here you see a, a plot of the predicted gravitational wave spectrum, the amplitude at some characteristic frequency and some reference uh, frequency in the enhanced curvature perturbation spectrum. Um, and the color code indicates the mass of the produced uh, primordial black holes uh, plus the nanograph constraints. So if you are here in this parameter space, is your, if, your gravita if your scalar power spectrum is peaked at this scale and we have this amplitude of the gravitational waves, then we have primordial black holes around a thousand solar masses and they can actually be the seeds of supermassive black holes at the center of um, galaxies. Okay, um, then these authors, these Japanese authors, they have studied uh, the same scenario basically, but made different assumptions about inflation uh, and maybe also about some of the technicalities in the calculation. So they find primordial black holes around uh, in, in the solar mass range. Okay, and they find this gravitational wave spectrum of uh, scalar induced gravitational waves at second order and perturbation theory. But then the primordial black holes in the solar mass range, they form binaries again uh, and they merge themselves. So they lead to a secondary gravitational wave background. So now we have a background of gravitational waves from these PBH mergers uh, and that can become pretty large actually at uh, high frequencies. So the secondary gravitational waves from PBH mergers might then be within the reach of these interferometer experiments. That's, yeah, a stochastic gravitational wave background from mergers. That's another interesting uh, possibility. And then finally, uh, these Italian authors here have also studied um, nanograph and uh, PBH uh, formation. Uh, and they assume a, um, uh, they assume a very um, a peculiar form of um, the scalar power spectrum, the enhanced scalar power, sorry, enhanced scalar power spectrum, which leads to this funny um, mass function for the primordial black holes. I think it's a bit hard to read, but here you see um, how much, uh, how the uh, how the masses of the P, how the PBH masses are are distributed uh, across this mass scale here, and obviously this is this mass function is is constrained. Um, in the different mass ranges. But then if you have such a, a peculiar form here, you can actually hide lots of primordial black holes from these observational probes. And if you integrate over this uh, yellow curve here, 
then you find that um, the total is just one, which means that 100% of dark matter is accounted for by primordial black holes. So in this scenario, they can have uh, PBH uh, dark matter uh, because most of the primordial black holes are located here at very small masses uh, around 10 to the minus 12 solar masses. Okay, so uh, these three papers, I would say they reflect the range of uncertainties and opportunities of this mechanism. Uh, it obviously depends very much on your underlying assumptions about inflation and the scalar power spectrum. Uh, but then there are also lots of open questions in the technical calculation of um, PBH production, a technical description of PBH production and gravitational wave production. Um, so for the experts here, a couple of open questions. You have to specify the input scalar power spectrum. Uh, there are different formalisms to tackle all these questions, press Schechter versus peak theory, and so on and so forth. So at the moment, you see that there's lots of possibilities. But in general, yeah, it is an interesting possibility that these uh, that the nanograph signal might be related to uh, primordial black holes. All right. So next, I want to talk about phase transitions. We talked about phase transitions yesterday as well. Um, strong first order cosmological phase transitions uh, can lead to gravitational waves uh, in, in different ways. Um, strongly super cold phase transitions for instance, can lead to gravitational waves from the collision of vacuum bubbles. But then if you have a non-runaway phase transition in plasma, sound waves and magnetohydrodynamic turbulence in the plasma can lead to a gravitational wave signal. Okay, I just want to showcase two examples. This is again here by these Japanese authors. Um, they study a phase transition in a dark sector, in a completely decoupled dark sector that only interacts uh, with the visible, with the standard model sector gravitationally. Um, so that dark sector phase transition leaves behind some amount of dark radiation. You have to be careful that you don't violate any bounds on delta N effective. Uh, but it turns out that the gravitational wave spectrum from sound waves and turbulence is then actually correlated with the amount of energy and yeah, the value of delta N effective in the dark sector. So then if you push delta N effective to values around 0.4, uh, you actually have enough energy in the dark sector to explain the nanograph signal uh, yeah, by in terms of gravitational waves from such a phase transition. And it's also interesting that if you are left with such an amount of dark radiation, then this might help to actually uh, relax the Hubble tension. Um, yeah, I mean, I want to talk about uh, the Hubble tension here in this lecture, but uh, at least these, org these authors argue and mention that um, such an explanation might be related to the Hubble tension. Uh, then there was another paper by these authors here. They also consider gravitational waves from a first order phase transition, but they actually look at um, a slightly non-standard realization of the QCD phase transition. So uh, I mentioned already yesterday, yes, I mentioned yesterday that the QCD phase transition can be of first order if it's embedded in um, a background with large lepton asymmetries. And if that's the case, then magnetohydrodynamic turbulence can actually generate gravitational waves during the QCD phase transition. Um, and what's interesting about this explanation here is that you produce some magnetic fields during the phase transition um, that survive uh, up to recombination and yeah, may maybe beyond, but I'm not sure, but at least you uh, generate magnetic fields during the QCD phase transition. And this may then also help to relax the, the Hubble tension. All right, so these are two interpretations uh, put forward in terms of phase transitions. And now um, I finally want to turn to uh, cosmic strings again. Uh, I want to look at Nambugoto strings. So just purely one dimensional cosmic strings. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, without any, uh, um, without uh, taking into account uh, particle degrees of freedom. So the mechanism is that we spontaneously break a local U1 symmetry, uh, produce this network of cosmic strings that reaches uh, the scaling regime, a scaling network of local cosmic strings. Um, and then we can look at the gravitational wave emission by cosmic string loops in the number go to uh, approximation. Um, this is what has been done by John Ellis and then Mark Levitsky, pretty um, much right after Nanograph had 
announced its observation. And this is also what uh, yeah, two of my collaborators and I did in this paper here. So uh, this is from the analysis in collaboration with uh, Simone Blasi and Vedran Burda. And yeah, we scan the cosmic string parameter space. We scan the cosmic string tension and the loop size parameter alpha and just calculate the gravitational wave spectrum, perform a simple, a single power law fit to our gravitational wave spectrum, and then compute our predictions for gamma and A. And you see the result here in these two plots. The points are the same. So the points are the same in this panel and in this panel. The only difference is the color code. So here the color code indicates the cosmic string tension and here the color code indicates the loop size parameter alpha. And we overlay this with the one and two sigma constraints from Nanograph. And now we see that we can actually nicely populate the inner parts of the one sigma uh, contour, uh, which is not really possible with this explanation in terms of supermassive black hole binaries. I mean, supermassive black, supermassive black hole binaries are still perfectly consistent, but nano uh, cosmic strings also do a pretty good job. All right. Um, Yes, this is exactly what I just said. Uh, we fit our spectrum and uh, convert this to our values of gamma and A. Um, and it's straightforward to populate the one and two sigma regions. Um, I want to show you the plot again, but now in the alpha versus or uh, yeah, alpha versus G mu plane. This is what you can see here. So now I have alpha and G mu on these two axes, loop size parameter and cosmic string tension. And we can just map the one and two sigma nanograph constraints uh, onto this parameter space. And you see that there's a large viable region where we can explain the nanograph signal. We have to pay attention to the cosmic, uh, to the CMB bound. Uh, I mentioned this in the first lecture today. So G mu cannot be larger than 10 to the minus seven. But apart from this, um, this is a large viable parameter space. And yeah, you can look at individual benchmark um, scenarios. So we can look at the circle or the diamond or the star and just plot the gravitational wave spectrum and you can see it here. Obviously all these spectra, they intersect at the same location here just by construction because all of these spectra are supposed to explain the nanograph signal. Um, and then they extend to higher frequencies. Um, and this is a consequence of this yeah, scaling behavior. I mean, um, in, in our analysis, we use a version of the uh, VOS model, the velocity dependent one scale model. So our spectra look very similar to the ones you find in the BOS model um, and not like in the LRS model. Um, so we have a flat plateau here at, at this amplitude at higher frequencies. And that leads to the amazing conclusion that the entire viable parameter space will be probed in future experiments. You can take any of the points here inside the one and two sigma contours, look at the spectrum, and then you see that this will be probed by next generation ground-based interferometers and LISA. Um, yeah, so you will be able to perform complementary measurements at high frequencies, and this will then constrain the expansion history of the universe. If something non-standard should happen to the expansion history of the early universe, you will see it here in the gravitational wave spectrum. Um, this is very similar to the transfer function for gravitational waves from inflation that we discussed. Uh, in, in principle, the entire ex expansion history also leaves its imprint here. So if you look very carefully at this spectrum, uh, you see uh, an imprint in changes in the number of effective degrees of freedom and in all of that. So if you can measure the spectrum up here and you should find any surprises, then um, this would indicate some non-standard expansion history. We can also take our values of g times mu here on this axis uh, between 10 to the minus 10 and 10 to the minus 7 uh, and convert this into an estimate for the underlying u1 symmetry breaking scale. So if nanograph, the nanograph signal is really due to cosmic strings, um, these cosmic strings must have been created in a phase transition at energies between 10 to the 14 and 10 to the 16 GeV. And that's very intriguing because this is remarkably close to um, yeah, typical values of the unification scale in grand unified theories, yep, in the context of grand unification. All right. Um, yes, I think I'm, I'm doing not too bad on time, actually, so I think I still have some time to, uh, to, to mention uh, this here, what I want to say. Um, I mean, cosmic strings, in my view, are not just one, just one more additional 
possibility to explain some ad hoc mechanism to explain the nanograph signal. But in principle, cosmic strings might be, the origin of cosmic strings might be do, um, deeply rooted in particle physics. So let me talk a, about a possible origin of cosmic strings in particle physics. And I want to focus on the seesaw extension of the standard model. So I guess many people in the audience will be familiar uh, with this. In the seesaw extension of the standard model, I just take the particle content of the standard model and extend it by right-handed neutrinos, which are not present in the standard model. And these right-handed neutrinos uh, are completely neutral under all the standard model gauge interactions. Uh, and then this is why they can um, have very large Majorana masses uh, that are not controlled by the standard model Higgs mechanism. All right, uh, and then these heavy right-handed neutrinos, uh, they can explain the origin of neutrino mass via the seesaw mechanism um, and thus explain neutrino oscillations that we observed in experiments and also set the stage for baryogenesis via leptogenesis. Um, okay, uh, yes, and then neutrinos, heavy neutrinos uh, are also uh, closely related to the symmetries of the standard model and possible extensions of that symmetry. So the classical standard model Lagrangian uh, is accidentally symmetric under a global baryon number symmetry and a global lepton number symmetry. So if you write down the divergence of the baryon number current and the divergence of the lepton number current in the standard model, it's zero up to uh, quantum terms. I mean, for the experts, um, yeah, uh, it, it's violated by non-perturbative uh, Svalaron uh, processes. Uh, but then uh, these are the same terms for barrier number and lepton number in the standard model. So if I just take the difference B minus L, then this is really um, an accidental symmetry of the standard model, even at the quantum level. Um, so it's possible to promote B minus L uh, to a local gauge symmetry. Uh, and yeah, just supplement the standard model gauge group by some U1 B minus L. Uh, to be fully consistent, I have to add three right-handed neutrinos such that, um, yeah, uh, the U1 B minus L is not violated uh, by itself by, um, by some U1 uh, B minus L anomaly, uh, some terms that depend on the U1, uh, on the B minus L gauge boson here on the right-hand side. Okay, so B minus L, a gauge B minus L is a very well motivated exp extension of the standard model. Uh, it requires these three right-handed neutrinos. Uh, and then the breaking of B minus L in the early universe generates the large masses for the right-handed neutrinos that are necessary uh, for the seesaw mechanism and to explain neutrino oscillations and the barren asymmetry of the universe. So, um, I would say that cosmic B minus L strings, strings created during the breaking of this U1 B minus L symmetry, are uh, ideal candidates for cosmic strings created in the early universe. Um, and yeah, I just talked about a simple U1 B minus L extension of the standard model, but you can turn this into a more general picture. Um, so now you can think about possible embeddings of the seesaw model of the seesaw extension of the standard model into some grand unified theory. So suppose, um, I mean, we live down here uh, where the gauge symmetry is, okay, uh, we have access to energies where the gauge symmetry is described by the standard model gauge uh, symmetry. Uh, then there might be some U1 B minus L factor at higher energies, but eventually uh, all of this is embedded into some grand unified theory, uh, maybe eventually SO10. Um, and well, the general picture then would be that in this UV embedding, the UV embedding of the seesaw mechanism, uh, there's some symmetry that initially forbids right-handed neutrino masses. So U1 B minus L is one example. Uh, but then to set the stage for the seesaw mechanism in this UV theory, you have to spontaneously break that protective uh, symmetry at some point. So um, here you see a classification of different symmetries by, by these authors from 2019, uh, and then here they list a couple of symmetries that can forbid right-handed uh, neutrino masses. You have to break that symmetry to generate the neutrino masses, uh, such that massive neutrinos can explain neutrino oscillations and the barren asymmetry. But then if you break the symmetry, so you break this symmetry or any of these other symmetries, 
uh, you will produce cosmic defects uh, that can potentially lead to gravitational waves. So in many cases, these are actually cosmic strings. Uh, this is denoted by these yellow arrows here. So if you break U1B minus L, you will produce cosmic strings. Um, this is the standard model gauge group, and this is the standard model gauge group times meta parity. So in both cases, uh, you produce cosmic strings. But also, if you start from this gauge group, you produce cosmic strings. If you produce from this, if you start from this gauge group, you produce cosmic strings. So, in a sense, in these UV completions of the seesaw model, this would be a quite a generic prediction. And I think this is why uh, cosmic strings are highly motivated because there might be this deep connection to the seesaw mechanism, neutrino masses, and the barrenness symmetry of the universe. All right. Um, yes. I mean, this is again some some self promotion. I think we can be very uh, quick here. Um, this is just to show that in ongoing research, you can always take it a step further. Uh, what I did with my collaborators here is to consider the possibility of uh, meter stable cosmic strings. Um, then the gravitational wave spectrum will only extend up to some uh, yeah finite, some finite frequency here on this axis. And we can talk about this later if you like. Uh, we also considered some non-standard expansion history after U1 breaking where the U1 breaking field uh, still drives an era of early meta domination. And we can talk about this later if you like. Just wanted to, to mention these two papers. Um, and now during the last, yeah, last, last 10 minutes or so, last few minutes, I think I will not even need 10 minutes. Uh, I want to give you a brief, brief outlook on the future of the field. And I will particularly focus on, um, yeah, PTA measurements. So here is the view by Nanograph itself, by the Nanograph collaboration, how they think things will move forward in the coming years. So in this paper here from October last year, they performed an analysis uh, projection uh, based on emulated data, and they study how the signal to noise ratio in detecting the signal will improve in the future, and also how the confirmation of the headings and downs curve will improve in the future. So we can look at this first plot here. Um, suppose that the true value of the gravitational wave amplitude is, is this one here, two times 10 to the minus 15. Uh, and then we see how the signal to noise ratio of this detection will improve uh, over the coming years. So we are here right now, but then with 18 years of data, the signal to noise ratio will have uh, grown to a value of 105 because we crossed this uh, contour line here. Yeah, and I mean, right now we are above, a bit above, um, 25. And yeah, so this will steadily increase in the coming years. Here in the second row, you see how the determination of the angular correlations will improve in the future. So right now we're in a situation similar to this one here with a bit more than 12 years of data and large error bars. And it's not quite clear. It's not that easy to really um, see the sellings and downs correlation here. There's only a small single to noise ratio for that um, determination. But then with 15 years of data, the error bars will be much smaller already. And, and uh, we will be able to have more, uh, we need to have clearer evidence for the Hellings and Downs correlation. And then with 20 years of data, the situation will be again, uh, much better. So in the coming years, uh, with 15 to 20 years of data, uh, there will hopefully, of course, hopefully, we don't know yet, but hopefully there will be robust evidence for the Hellings and Downs correlation. Um, and then with more than 20 years of data, um, it will be possible to detect deviations from a simple power law. I mean, right now, Nanograph just performs a simple power law fit, but with more than 20 years of data, uh, you will be able to actually resolve the frequency dependence of the spectrum uh, at a higher level of precision. All right. And I mean, this is just based on some projection, assuming the same number of pulses as in the uh, most recent analysis, but there will be much faster progress if we combine the data sets from different PTA experiments, so nanograph plus PPTA plus EPTA, uh, and also if we add more pulses to the analysis, the progress will be even faster than what is shown here or what is yeah uh, what is shown here by this analysis. All right, um, I also want to uh, point you to an interesting statement in the nanograph paper. Mm. Ah, okay, so I think this should be the September paper, not the October paper. Uh, but anyway, so in the first paper, in the conclusions, Nanograph writes that the second IPTA data set release 
includes the nine year nanograph data set alongside EPTA and PPTA timing observations. The analysis of this joint data set is ongoing and early results are again consistent with those discussed here. So this is already a statement in the nanograph paper and that sounds very promising. It seems like that behind closed doors, these collaborations are already in, in, um, yeah, working on the next data analysis, combining these data sets, nanograph plus EPTA plus PPTA. And it seems like they're seeing something similar and everything appears to be uh, consistent. So I think this is already a very valuable and interest interesting hint. And I think this is pointing into the right direction. But also the nanograph 15 year data set is on the horizon. The nanograph is, I think, uh, currently analyzing 15 years of data. Uh, and this will add 2.5 more years of data. And they will actually have more than 20 new pulsars in the 15 year data set. So nanograph itself will also push things forward. Um, in October last year, there was this paper on PPTA. In this paper, they um, look at individual noise models for the 26 uh, PPTA pulses. Uh, you can see this here in this plot. So they don't try to find a gravitational wave signal. They just try to improve the noise models for 26 pulses. So you see um, this amplitude for the noise model of each of the individual pulses here and the spectral index gamma up here. And you have 26 data points for each of the individual pulses. Um, but they have a very interesting comment here in the caption saying that some of these data points begin to cluster uh, and they, they begin to cluster around a gamma around 13 over three. And if in these noise models, the parameters begin to cluster, it seems like that what you're actually seeing in the data is not really parser noise, but it's a common process, something that affects all the parsers in the same way. Um, and then this is how gravitational waves uh, could potentially manifest themselves here in, in such an analysis. And it's very interesting to see that this, the, that you start to see this clustering here around this value, which is exactly the value that it, you expect for supermassive black hole binaries. All right. Uh, but then also in the future, we will move forward uh, with more experiments, for instance, FAST in China and then SKA in South Africa and Australia. Yes, and that brings me to um, the end of uh, this lecture. I'm, I'm happy that I didn't have to go over time this time. Um, so my conclusions are the nanograph signal is strong evidence for a new stochastic common spectrum process. Uh, the evidence for the headings downs curve is not yet conclusive, but hopefully soon with more data. Uh, the standard astrophysical explanation of the signal would be mergers of a supermassive black hole bi binaries. Uh, but there's a vast area of BSM explanations, including inflation, primordial black holes, audible axions, and phase transitions. But of course, also gravitational waves from cosmic strings, they would provide a particularly well-motivated BSM interpretation um, because these cosmic strings are possibly closely related to right-handed neutrinos, UV completions of the seesaw mechanism uh, and leptogenesis. Uh, Follow-up PTA analyses are underway and lots of more data is gonna come in the coming years. Uh, and the next years will be decisive in the search for and hopefully also detection of a stochastic gravitational wave signal. So this is the end of this lecture, but there's one more slide that I want to show to you to conclude this entire lecture series. And it's this one here. Uh, let me read this text to you and then, then we are done. But my message to you after uh, these six long lectures on gravitational waves from the early universe is the following. Um, the invention of the telescope in the early 1600s revolutionized astronomy and our view of the cosmos. And you can see this here in this little, in this little image where Galileo Galilei in the early 1600s presents the telescope and its new observations uh, of the sky to those people here in Venice in Italy. And now with the advent of sensitive gravitational wave detectors, another window onto the universe opens up that will again revolutionize our understanding of the world around us. We have just, we have now set sail and just left the port to venture into an endless ocean of opportunities 
discoveries and surprises. Our stochastic gravitational wave background treasure map is still blank. You can see it here. Uh, I mean, these are all the experimental, experimental sensitivities uh, and we cannot put many signals in here into that treasure map, except for a very first data point, maybe, this would be nanograph here. So this could be really the start of exploring um, the stochastic gravitational wave background. And no one knows where the journey will lead us, but it will surely be exciting. I invite you to come on board and be part of this adventure that will certainly shape the course of physics in the 21st century. That's all I wanted to say. And thank you very much for your attention. OK, thank you. Thank you for your uh, very impressive conclusion. Uh, very impressive conclusion. <laughs> Okay, so now is uh, open for questions. Okay. If you have any questions, questions. and comments. If you have any questions. Let me ask a question. Uh, you, as, a, as an interpretation of nanograph uh, access, uh, you showed the example of uh -huh. particle production, like uh, all double actions. Mm -hmm. So you, you also mentioned in the previous lecture, uh, in the case of abelian foot models, uh, there is a lot of yes. particle production instead of uh, uh, loop, loops. So I don't know. Yes. My question is related to the to the abelian Higgs model. I don't know. I'm not familiar with, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, what is the what is the meaning of particle production, and is there any connection to uh, gravitational wave that, uh, that you mentioned? <laughs> yes, I mean the abelian Higgs model is basically um, yeah just the model of a complex scalar field living in a Mexican head potential that couples to a U1 gauge field. So it's really the simplest model that you can write down to produce cosmic strings. Uh, let me, it's not here in this lecture. Anyway, I, I'm just sorry, thinking sorry of this about, complex scalar uh, field. I should have asked potential. you sorry, sorry about, the previous uh, lecture. <laughs> I should have asked you the previous lecture. No, 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 no problem. I mean, I, this, this question perfectly fits here in, into this lecture. Um, and so the, the point is that the cosmic strings they originate from such a field theory. Uh, and then they consist of a scalar field configuration described by a configuration of your symmetry breaking Higgs field uh, and the configuration of the vector field, the vector field uh, belonging to your U1 gauge uh, symmetry. But um, these Higgs and vector configurations are extremely small compared to the cosmological scales in the problem. So the string has a finite width, which is given by the inverse of the Higgs mass and another core or another width, which is given by the inverse of the gauge boson mass. So these strings are uh, astronomically or cosmologically large. They stretch over um, light years or uh, uh, hundreds and thousands and millions of light years, but they have uh, still uh, some subatomic width uh, and now the question is, what is the best approach to um, describe such objects uh, in numerical simulations? Uh, in principle, you would like to take into account and track all the relevant physics and really also resolve the finite width of these cosmic strings. Uh, but this becomes extremely challenging because of the huge separation of scales. On the one hand, you, have, you want to model um, several Hubble volumes um, uh, to, to see how the entire network evolves. At the same time, you want to resolve this a microscopic uh, scale uh, on subatomic uh, length scales. Uh, this becomes very challenging. And that's why you would say that at some later stages during the evolution, um, it's perfectly fine to describe the cosmic strings as purely one dimensional objects. Just forget about this microscopic width uh, and then you use the number go to action to describe your cosmic strings. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that in numerical simulations of a billion Higgs strings at very early times, I mean, as long as you can run the simulation, mm -hmm. you actually see how strings and also string loops can emit heavy gauge bosons and heavy Higgs particles. And the masses of these particles are given by the symmetry breaking scale. 
So if the symmetry breaking scale is 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 GeV, you multiply this by some coupling constant, by some scalar self coupling constant or by some gauge coupling constant. Mm -hmm. And then you get these masses of the Higgs mm -hmm. and, and gauge bosons, which are still extremely, extremely large. Mm -hmm. um, and then naively you would think that um, some low momentum excitations of the cosmic strings, they cannot uh, lead to the emission of such heavy particles, uh, but you can still see it in the numerical simulations. And if that should really be correct, and um, many people believe it's correct, uh, other people believe that there might be something, um, mm. uh, yeah, something odd about this. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, so if, if, that, if that should really happen, uh, if the strings emit these heavy gauge and Higgs particles, then the loops will be very short lived. They will just evaporate into, um, mm -hmm. into heavy particles. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the expectation is that maybe at some later stage that you cannot cover in the simulations, there's some transition where um, the Abel and Higgs picture really transitions into the number Goto picture. Uh, and then after some late time, it's perfectly okay to use the number Goto description, but you cannot run the simulation across this transition point. Um, so if you believe that this is what's happening, then um, it's, it's hard to determine how many string loops actually survive this emission period and make it to the number go to period. Um, so if, if, if you believe that this really happens, then your number go to your, sorry, your cosmic string loops will be strongly suppressed. Maybe almost all of them decay into radiation and only a tiny fraction, 10 to the minus three, four, five, it's, it's impossible to quantify, a tiny fraction will survive uh, and then live in the number go to regime where a one dimensional description is really perfectly okay. Uh, and this will then lead to a the suppression of the gravitational wave spectrum. But mm -hmm. all of what I just said, I think is really the uh, subject of an ongoing debate in the literature. And there are different groups uh, with different opinions and tackling these simulations from different perspectives. I'm not an expert on this. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there are really very different opinions on, on these questions. Um, it's not settled yet. And if you see an analysis, like my analysis or our analysis, where everything is just based on a purely number go to picture, you have to take this with a grain of salt. Yeah, so that still comes with uh, some uncertainty uh, and the picture might change if we understand this number go to versus a and Hicks story better in the future. The stream loop, loops in the end they shrink to zero. That's the stream loops in the end they shrink to zero. Gravitational Radiation. waves. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I mean, this is uh, this is the way. I mean, in the number goto picture, this is the way how the network loses energy. Um, I mean, mm, the to maintain this scaling regime, it's necessary that the string network somehow loses energy, um, and uh, emission by gravitational waves is exactly how this happens. Um, in, in the number water picture. Yeah. Okay, there should be more questions. I think the other one. There should be more questions. I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, this is the end of six, six lectures. I mean, I guess people are also a bit tired <laughs> after listening to me for 10 hours. <laughs> but please, yeah, if there's another question, please go ahead. Yes. Uh... First of all, thank you very much for the nice uh, lectures. First of all, thank you very much. For the nice you you talked about this. Uh, uh, you, you talked about this uh, size of the uh, loop string loop alpha. Size of the loop string loop. So alpha equal to one corresponds to how how large is it? Alpha equal one corresponds to. Yes. So. You, you are muted. Yes, okay, so now you can hear me again. You yes, now not anymore, but yeah, thank you, Hyunmin, for muting me. I'm really sorry for this uh, echo signal. But anyway, um, yes, so yeah, I was a bit quick on this uh, in the first lecture today. Alpha is dimensionless, mm. and alpha equals one means that the cosmic string loops have a size as large as the Hubble radius mm. at the time when they are produced. Okay, um, the Hubble radius is the characteristic length scale in the problem during the scaling regime. Um, and alpha is just a dimensionless number that relates the initial 
cosmic string loop size to, to, um, to the Hubble radius. And in numerical simulations, I mean, there are not many numerical simulations, uh, just a few, um, but uh, these show some clear preference for alpha values around 0.1 or so. I mean, maybe within, yeah, within a factor of a few. So if you see these results and these discussions in the literature, gravitational waves from cosmic strings, very often people just set alpha to 0.1. That means the cosmic string loops are as large as 10% of mm -hmm. the Hubble radius at the time of production. Um, so for instance, I mean, I can just mention this briefly. Uh, there were these two papers here on the archive on the same day. Uh, um, I mean, this really came out just after the weekend. The nanograph paper appeared on Friday, and then these two papers were on the archive on Tuesday. Um, and yes, uh, Mark Levitsky and John Ellis, they, um, they focus on exactly this alpha value, alpha of 0.1. Uh, and then uh, we were able to compare our results to their results for this value of alpha. Uh, and I mean, yeah, there were some technical questions that we had to talk about, but uh, in the end, uh, we found um, yeah, almost perfect uh, agreement. So I, I would say um, the values for alpha equals 0.1 are maybe the most interesting ones. And uh, you can find the numbers uh, here in this paper. And uh, yeah, it, it's also included in our analysis. So when you calculate this uh, uh, gravitational wave, uh, uh, from the, the using wave. the Nambugoto uh, picture, do you put any uh, cutoff in the high frequency region or not? Ah uh, yes, this is this is an excellent question. I mean, in principle, it's there. Mm. Um, I mean, mm. but but it really depends on the temperature at which you produce these uh, cosmic strings, and um, for the values of the symmetry breaking scale that we find here, you would assume that the phase transition, this U one phase transition, occurs at a very high temperature, um, which leads to a cutoff that you cannot see anymore here in this plot. So mm. somewhere here at higher frequencies, 10 to the seven, eight, nine uh, Hertz, there should, be a, there should be a cutoff. Yes, just because um, these cosmic strings have not been around forever, they have been produced only at a finer temperature. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this is at extremely high temperatures, at, at extremely high frequencies. Uh, and then for nanograph, I mean, to get these data points here that you see here in the plot, you just need to know the spectrum. Um, at these frequencies anyway. And this is already at much, much later times in the cosmological evolution. I mean, this is not too far away from um, the time of radiation meta quality. Okay. Yes, so in the 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 simulation, in the I mean, okay, so. Yeah, sorry, uh, one, one short question. In the numerical oh, simulation for string dynamics, you use a classical Lambugoto action, not Polyakov action for string. Right. Um, yes, I mean, we don't do it. Yes, I mean, I mean, in our analysis, we don't do any of these uh, simulations. Uh, we just use the results that are present in the literature. Mm. But yes, when people simulate number go to strings, it's really the number go to action. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, just uh, one-dimensional and featureless cosmic strings. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, I mean, I briefly mentioned this towards the end of the last lecture. Um, I mean, typically these cosmic strings, they have some field theory origin because you break some U1 symmetry in a field theory. But there are also models where um, this entire analysis applies to cosmic super strings. So then the strings are not some field theory strings, but strings that uh, correspond to fundamental strings from string theory that are blown up and stretched to cosmological sizes. I mean, this requires some special assumptions. Uh, this works in particular models of uh, string theory of a D brain uh, in inflation. Uh, but then you talk about cosmic super strings, uh, and then, then uh, they can also be described in terms of the number go to action. Um, but there might be some differences. For instance, uh, if you have a network of cosmic super strings, it might be, I mean, it, it's expected that um, the probability with which you can cut off certain segments or some cut off some loops will be a bit reduced because um, 
these cosmic strings are uh, in in quantum mechanical superposition states. Uh, maybe <clears throat> if this is embedded into string theory, there's some uh, compactified uh, internal dimensions, uh, and then there's uh, yeah there's the possibility that two cosmic strings they approach each other, but they miss each other because they don't meet in the extra dimensions and things things like that. So um, yeah, but there you also use the number go to action. I'm I'm not aware of any other string action, like the Polyakov action, I think you just mentioned. Um, I'm not sure that this has been used for the simulation of these cosmic strings. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's some more question here. Uh... Yeah, I, I'm going. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you considered the possibility of uh, corruption wave gener generations from cosmic strings uh actually the interaction among cosmic strings uh, kink or the splitting or like that what about I, i'm not sure if it makes sense but what about the the uh, corruption wave generations through the the interaction with the other objects like black holes or primary black holes or some Kind of some, some kind of suppose some. Uh, you have the yes. uh, oh, that's bunch a of uh, black holes around the supermassive black holes and cosmic string just sheeps and string just sheeps. Okay, um, uh, that's that's a very interesting, yeah. interesting question that I have not thought about much, I, I must say. But, um, okay, so I think one question is at, at what time in the early universe do you want to consider? Right, right. Such a situation. I mean, uh, for, right, what you, right. for, for what you say, it's necessary that cosmic strings and primordial black holes are around right, right. at the same time. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes a bit model dependent right, right. already. So you have to see at what time the primordial black holes are produced. I can also say that um, in the scaling regime, the number of long cosmic strings per Hubble volume typically mm -hmm. is not very large. So in the scaling oh, right, regime, right. Uh, you consider one Hubble oh. volume. I mean, Hubble volume oh. is very small at early times and oh. has, has very large today when it is as large as the observable oh. universe. But the number of long cosmic strings per Hubble volume during oh. the scaling regime is some order, num one, order one number. So three, four, five, something like this. Um, for global strings, it's a bit more complicated, but yeah, this is what you find. So that means that, uh, for instance, today in our observable universe, if the cosmic string network should still be around, uh, you would only have a small number of long cosmic strings in the entire observable universe, maybe just an order number one, uh, order one number, three, four, five cosmic strings. Um, and then I'm not sure what is the probability that these cosmic strings can interact with uh, any other objects so that this leads to some um, relevant additional contribution to the gravitational wave spectrum. So mm. I, I just don't know um, whether this can lead to any any important effect if this happens at earlier times in the early universe. Mm. Uh, but I can say that people think about the interaction between cosmic strings and, and black holes. I mm. mean, it's a possibility that black holes are, for instance, uh, pierced by cosmic strings. Yeah, so you have a black hole, mm. and then there's one cosmic string, or maybe even more cosmic strings, attached to the black hole. Uh, mm. I think this is a very interesting possibility. Uh, and it might be that. Uh, yeah, heavy black holes, maybe uh, supermassive black holes at the center of at the centers of galaxies. They actually mm. uh, all host a supermassive black hole, and then yeah. uh, then cosmic strings are attached to these yeah. black holes, and that can lead to a signals of uh, gravitational waves. That would be something interesting to look for. Mm. I mean, people also study independent of these scaling arguments. People also study what would happen if a cosmic string was located inside the Milky Way. So if mm. cosmic strings are very close to us, maybe because they attach to black holes, mm. uh, you could hope to see individual gravitational wave bursts. So I mean, mm. here in, in these lectures today, I just talked about stochastic gravitational waves, a background of gravitational waves from very early times. But if a cosmic string should be very close to us for one reason or another, it might be that you can see a transient signal, just a burst coming from a cosmic string cusp or a cosmic string loop. Uh, a kink, I mean, on a, on a, on a loop. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, a kink or a cusp on a, on a cosmic string. 
Um, so people take this serious. Uh, and, and I mean, I think the probability is hard to quantify, but it would be amazing if you could see a gravitational wave burst from a nearby cosmic string. And the uh, cosmic string may accelerate the margin process of black holes. May accelerate the margin process of black holes. I don't know. Okay, I mean, this is... <laughs> it it um, expels the, the black yeah. hole if it's attached? Is this a question? Is this a question or a statement? I mean, maybe you know more about no, this no, than I, I am a question. I, I, I'm ignorant. I don't know. Cosmic, the property I, I, of I, I, cosmic I, I, string. But ah, okay. Basically, it's gravitationally attract. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I guess there, there might be some non-trivial dynamical effect. That's uh -huh. true, but yeah, I mean, that, that's something okay. I've not thought about. Uh, okay. But yeah, I think the interaction between cosmic strings and other objects, okay. um, that's, that's something very interesting. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yes, I mean, okay. cosmic strings okay. might also emit, I mean, if you, yeah, in this particle picture, gravitational waves at later times might also emit uh, uh, gamma ray bursts. Um, so if a cosmic string is close enough, uh, you could hope to, to see evidence or to find signatures, not only in gravitational waves. Um, yeah, I mean, people are trying to find evidence for cosmic strings in different channels. Uh, maybe gravitational waves is the way to go. We will see how this turns out in the future. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the confirmation of the existence of cosmic strings would be very profound, would be very fundamental, because this would really tell us a lot about particle physics and cosmology at extremely high energies. Uh, I have a question and comment. Uh, there was the um, papers and recently the uh, papers on spot conducting strings. strings. Papers on spot conducting strings. So yes. like action strings, if if they are stable, like yeah, they are current, they are exist at present, and they might uh, uh, enter encounter sometimes and collide, produce some signals, I don't know, gravitational signals, I don't know. Have you thought about some stable uh, string loops uh, that survive until now? Um, yes, yes, yes. Um, I mean, in, in the picture that I, that I talked about here, if you talk about, yeah, I mean, if, stable cosmic strings, no modification, um, then that network should still be around today. And it should still form new cosmic, uh, it should still form new loops. Um, I mean, now, given the current value of the Hubble rate, this would happen on extremely long time scales. I would take billions of years before these strings intersect again somewhere and build a new loop, uh, an extremely large loop then. Uh, Okay, so maybe, okay, sorry, I, I should correct myself. Um, one difference is that now we have entered the era of dark energy domination and the universe is expanding again. Um, so this means that the, cosmics, that the cosmic strings will no longer be able to maintain uh, its scaling regime. Uh, and then I think they will all just, uh, I mean, the cosmic string loops, they will disappear by emitting gravitational waves. Um, so if it was not for dark energy and some accelerated expansion right now in the late universe, in that case, without any cosmological constant, the story would just continue. Then during matter domination, even if the Hubble rate is very low, the cosmic string network would remain in its uh, scaling regime and would continue to form new loops that emit gravitational waves and, and, and so on. Uh, and what you mentioned about the superconducting strings, that's very interesting because there, the superconducting strings, they cannot go to a zero, the cosmic string loops cannot go to a zero size by the emission of gravitational waves, because if they're superconducting, there will be a current on these loops, okay? And then this current, this electromagnetic current on the cosmic string loops stabilizes their size and they will turn into, ah, somebody has to leave now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, they will turn into stable objects, vortons, yeah, that can no longer shrink in size because of the current that they carry. Uh, and these vortons could be uh, a possible candidate for dark matter. That's, I mean, there are at least studies that claim that possibility, but I think it's interesting. Um, so in the case of superconducting strings, you can leave, have, you can uh, be left with these vortons. 
Okay, thank you for your comment. Okay, can so I, can I give you a question? Sherry, sure, in, in this slide, I just wonder if this uh, particle production is due to this uh, particle production parity violation or any other parity violation? So you can uh, ask, yeah, I, yeah, you can ask, uh, in a, yeah, you can ask, continue to ask. Yeah, so I just wonder the reason for this uh, exponential particle production in from this interaction term. Um, yeah, I, if I understood correctly, you asked whether that involves any any parity violation, and I think parity does not need to does not need to be violated uh, for this particle production. Uh, and apart from this. Um, Yes, uh, I mean the way you can think about this is that the cosmic string itself, at the microscopic at the microscopic level, is composed of these quantum fields. It's it is composed of I mean in the end you describe it in terms of uh, classical equations of motion, but um, the cosmic string is composed of a gauge field configuration and a Higgs field configuration, and then if you have certain features along the cosmic strings or the cosmic string loops such as a cusp or kink then these quantum fields or classical fields, they can emit individual uh, particles. Yeah, just the constituents uh, of the fields out of which the cosmic string is uh, composed. Yeah, so it basically the cosmic string emits, um, spits out uh, particles of the fields that it's made of. Yeah, so I think you don't need any, any extra um, interaction term um, so you just have uh, a specific gauge field configuration and that can spit out gauge bosons and you have a Higgs field configuration and that can lead to the production of Higgs particles. Oh. I guess this, yeah, this I is <laughs> all I can say on this. Um, I'm, I'm yeah. not sure whether I understood the question, but uh, yeah, so the, the string can emit the particles that it's composed of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They also ask a question. So, a lot, you know, among all of these uh, scenarios, there's also, of course, the possibility of supermassive black hole binaries, and uh, it and its uh, background. So, can we sort of like use? So, if there's like a structure around like a supermassive black hole binary, at like a sort of like a common structure that sort of like contributes to the stochastic gravitational wave background, will it have like a distinctive feature on the predictions of the supermassive black hole binary signal? And will that be sort of uh, be able to measure in let's say future nanograph uh, spectrums or future PT, uh, pulsar timing array spectrums? Just like the dynamics of the supermassive black hole, the binary like the dynamics of Something you the binary sense. Something. Uh, yes, yeah, this is an, a very important question. So thank you very much for asking. And I think I should have uh, maybe also mentioned this myself. Um, the question is how you can distinguish between different interpretations uh, of this uh, signal now seen by a binanograph. And I think the best way forward really is to uh, make these constraints here more precise. You really want to constrain the spectral properties of the signal as much as possible. Uh, and I mean, already now you see that um, the prediction from cosmic loops does not really overlap here with the interpretation in terms of supermassive black hole binaries. So I would say the PTA collaborations, they really hope to improve these constraints here uh, and narrow down um, the value of the spectral index at some, yeah, uh, in, in, the, in the observing band uh, and the value of the amplitude. So I think this is what is realistic uh, in, in the coming years. And I mentioned this on my, I think one of the very last slides, then with more than 20 years of data, you will start to be able to uh, resolve the spectrum even further beyond a simple power law fit. So uh, with 25 and 30 years of data, 
we can hope that we can really measure the shape of the spectrum, not only the slope, but um, the first derivative, the second derivative, so something like the, the index and the running of the index and the running and the ru running of the running of the index and things like that. Uh, and then more, the more you are able to do this, uh, the better you will be able to um, narrow down the allowed origin of, of this uh, signal. And yes, I mean, the prediction from the supermassive black holes, let's have a look at this again. Uh, it's, it's, it's here. Um, I mean, each individual, uh, it's, uh, let's see. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, if I say that this uh, power law dependency is an index of minus two thirds, it's just a fit through um, well, this, this messy region here uh, in, in, in the plot. Um, so in the case of the supermassive black hole binaries, uh, I think to really confirm that explanation, it would be amazing if you can resolve uh, systems individually. So at some point, if this is really the true explanation and your sensitivity increases, you would really like to see uh, an individual supermassive black hole binary somewhere in the sky, yes? And then you would be able to identify this continuous gravitational wave source really uh, in, the, I mean, in the best case, you would be able to identify this in a specific galaxy. And uh, I mean, in a sense, well, in the data analysis, you could point your uh, PTA experiment or your, yes, uh, your PTA gravitational wave experiment into the direction of uh, that individual uh, galaxy and then really look at this uh, continuous signal. And this should blend in or should be consistent with the background signal that you see. Um, so the more you can confirm this theoretical expectation here, stochastic background plus individual signals, uh, maybe the more confident you become in that interpretation in terms of supermassive black hole binaries. Yeah, I, I mean, I think all of this is, is feasible and possible. So if it's really supermassive black hole binaries, sooner or later, we will be able to confirm this picture here. Uh, and if you think about the spectral properties here, uh, sooner or later, these contours will become much smaller and more constraining. Um, so I think it's possible, it's just a matter of time. But uh, for some further improvement, I think we don't have to wait for, I don't know, 50 more years. Uh, the next couple of years, uh, will be really important. And then uh, now we will make progress step by step, but already in, in a few years from now, um, this situation here will be uh, much clearer uh, and it may be we'll also make progress here in the search for uh, individual supermassive black hole binaries. So I think PTA astronomy is in a very interesting situation right now. Uh, and there will be lots of important um, new results in the next 10 years or so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the, this, there's a lot, there are a lot of interpretations of the nano region because de depending on the uh, spectrum, mm -hmm. gravitational spectrum, gravitational wave spectrum, it seems that uh, uh, one can uh, distinguish between different models, in particular, in the case of cosmic strings, you have uh, scaling region where the gravitational wave spectrum is saturated so that we can probe them by other uh, experiment like uh, laser, yes, absolutely. LIGO, right. that's, that's absolutely that's right. complementary yes. probes of the same uh, origin unlike the other cases right so yeah it'll be very exciting to see uh, how the nanograph results are evolving and I think I didn't know, I didn't notice such an importance uh, of the, I mean, nanograph experiment. It's not the only, I mean, they, they are looking at the special specific window of the frequency, but the, there might be a lot of implications beyond that uh, frequency range. Absolutely, that, that's absolutely correct. I think cosmic strings are a very nice example where you can have complementary observations at, at higher frequencies. Um, of course, I mean, another model is if you make some assumptions or yeah, um, uh, if, if, if you just study specific scenarios, 
Uh, you can also make predictions for higher frequencies. I mean, here, for instance, in the case of the primordial black holes, um, yeah, I mean, uh, these authors, they also find a signal at higher frequencies. I mean, you have to ask a bit how model dependent these predictions are, uh, how generic they are, uh, and then are they really robust to the theoretical uncertainties here in these calculations? But in principle, yeah, these models also give you predictions for higher frequencies. Um, what I like about cosmic strings is that you don't have to work very hard uh, to get the signal at higher frequencies. I mean, it's really an intrinsic property of this cosmic string network. Just because the cosmic strings are in this scaling regime um, in a standard expansion history, uh, the spectrum here at high frequencies is basically guaranteed. It's, it's automatic. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, it's very interesting. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, to all of you attending these nice lectures. Uh, we enjoyed a lot, and, and uh, hopefully uh, we will continue to study uh, the gravity waves in more detail. In any, I think that there are a lot of discussion in these lectures from. Big Bang information in cosmology, uh, all the way to the current uh, universe. So in principle, we can probe the entire history of the universe from the gravitational waves, I hope. <laughs> OK. That's true. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, let's, I hope okay. so too. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Kai, I think most of all, thank you for your, a lot of effort on your lectures. I think this will be recorded and uh, I think many people will uh, appreciate your effort and we will, I think, collaborate on this topic in the future. And then there are also young people who attend this, these lectures. So I think I'm sure that they will ask you a lot of questions after, even after this. <laughs> after this. Yes, please. Yes. I mean, I, I uh, mentioned my email address uh, at the very beginning. Uh, I can put this in the chat again. Uh, okay, so email address. If you should have any further questions, if you go to YouTube and watch the lectures and you still have questions, please just uh, feel free to contact me via email and then we can get in touch and uh, discuss even further. Okay. Yeah, so uh, yeah, please, please make use of that possibility if you're interested. And thank you very much in the audience. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy that you um, uh, yeah, uh, stayed with me throughout these uh, six lectures. And this was a lot of material. I can imagine that some of the material was maybe also hard to digest. But um, yeah, I think from the discussion, uh, my impression is that um, yeah, uh, you were able to follow the, the lectures and, and uh, there were some very excellent questions that I was very happy about. So thank you very much for these questions and for the very interesting uh, discussion. And Hyun Min, also, thank you very much again for the invitation and this fantastic mm -hmm. opportunity. It has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was very, yeah. I enjoyed a lot. Okay. Uh, now we close, uh, we close the lecture session. Okay. Hopefully we'll see again in Seoul or in Sun in Europe in person. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Are you yes, absolutely. Office? I hope so too. Okay, yeah. Okay. Then hope to see you again soon.